This is the MediaCorp broadcast circuit of Parliament. Track 1. English. This is the MediaCorp broadcast circuit of Parliament. Track 1. English.
Mr. Speaker. Order. Questions for oral answer. Ms. Jean C. Question one, sir. Mr. Speaker, we have made health planning affordable <coughs> for healthy SG, HSG enrollees by fully subsidising their first health plan consultations with the enrolled family doctor. During these consultations, residents discuss follow-up actions to improve their health with their family doctors, such as health screening and exercise and diet adjustments. More than half of HSG enrollees have consulted their chosen doctors to develop a personal health plan. On top of this, there are other types of planning and support available from community partners and healthcare clusters. For example, Sport Singapore's Active Health Labs offer residents opportunities to have a guided fitness and health assessment and recommendations on how to achieve fitness and health goals. Healthcare providers are, can prescribe active health targeted programs to residents who are medically at risk of lifestyle related conditions such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, or hypertension. <coughs> Some community health posts provided by healthcare clusters at accessible locations such as active aging centres also provide support for individuals to make diet and lifestyle changes. Resources such as informative articles recommended. Programs are also available on Health Hub and Healthy365 to support residents in embracing a healthier lifestyle. Health planning and support covers a wide scope of activities involving different groups, including government agencies like MOH, PA and Sport SG, as well as the groups in the community like professional associations. All agencies and organisations across the healthcare and sporting ecosystems have a role to play in upskilling staff, volunteers and partners, including health and wellbeing coaches to support the delivery of better health. We see. Thank you, SPS. Um, I just wanted to find out whether there would be intention to have single touch points where those who are not uh, within the first, the first phase, say example, if I'm 40, I'm 30 plus, but I recognise that I would like to actually take a more active uh, action towards health planning, including diet, fitness, as well as lifestyle changes. But there be a single touch point who we could approach so that we can actually integrate all these various facilities and help available. Thank you. SPS, where are you? I think member from the question. Actually, in the work that we do, what we've realised is that people come across. Um, through our portals, through very different um, uh, situations, and they're all at different phases of their lives. So um, while it may be useful to have one touch point, actually in terms of actually reaching out, it is actually meaningful to have many different people doing it in different manners. That's why we work with various partners. Um, of course, there is um, the key sources of information which we want the um, citizens and residents to refer to, like um, Healthy365 and Health Hub. These are the sort of key sources, uh, key touch points, if you would refer it to that. But I think in terms of outreach, it actually is more meaningful to actually have different permutations, different platforms um, at workplaces, you know, especially for working adults, um, at the community for those who are a bit more um, elderly and maybe in schools for children. So I think while we do note that there needs to be a, a single resource, it might be helpful to have different touch points. If you are looking at it, though, from the perspective of, say, partners who want to work with us, perhaps I would suggest HPB maybe one is um, one um, agency that may be useful for you to kind of start off with. Um, but of course, like I said earlier, PA, Sport SG also do different dimensions of the work. I think um, if you do want to try and tie up for certain um, efforts together, I, we, you may refer it to me and perhaps we can connect you with HPB. Missy? Yeah, thank you, SPS. I think the perspective would be those of um, actually many PMEs. So PMEs that we come across, um, given that uh, people are now more aware of chronic illness and all that, so they do recognise that it does take actually a holistic approach to health. So not just from physical activity, but what types of physical activity, what types of diet. So I think people are also wondering if, example, um, from the Healthy365 or Health Hub, would there be a, a way in which they can actually take a more involved approach 
but seeking professional advice uh, to actually construct a health plan which would allow them to be personalised in addressing their ailments. Yeah. SPS Rahayu. As I mentioned earlier in my answer, there are different touch points for all these uh, PMEs to actually reach out to. And I think um, those are at the moment um, something that we're also building up. So if you have any other suggestions as to how we can uh, build on this further, we're happy to hear from you and we can see how we can make this a bit more meaningful for the community. Mr. Pongwing. Sir, many outpatient medical service providers are approved to provide telemedicine services under the Healthcare Services Act, HAXA, of which 19, one nine, are standalone telemedicine providers without physical premises. MOH does not track the take-up rate of telemedicine services. There's also no definitive data on whether telemedicine has reduced <coughs> non-emergency attendances at emergency departments, especially given an aging population with the rising demand for healthcare. Telemedicine services have been facilitated by MOH in primary care for chronic disease management and in specialist outpatient settings for specific conditions. MOH will continue to facilitate the application of telemedicine services in appropriate settings. Mr. Yim. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the SMS for his response. From a systems perspective, integrating telemedicine into existing care protocols, rather than offering them as an optional add-on, is critical for optimizing patient care delivery. This balanced approach empowers healthcare professionals to assess the most suitable modality for each patient's needs, avoiding unnecessary telemedicine use. Uh, with this in mind, I have two questions. First is, for new hospitals open to piloting telemedicine, can it be incorporated as a standard part of routine clinical practice? And second, beyond public awareness campaigns, are there plans to incentivize primary care physicians to utilize telemedicine for appropriate consultations? This could potentially reduce strain on emergency services and generate cost savings. Thank you. SMS General. So I thank Mr. Yip for his uh, questions. Um, telemedicine is a tool. Uh, the technology and the platform are potentially quite useful, in, and he has illustrated and described some of the ways in which it can change patterns of behavior. Um, it is a tool that needs to be chosen by two parties, the clinical provider and the patient or potential patient. Uh, so I think our approach is to say it's an option and uh, where it is a suitable option, in other, if for, and for the clinical providers because it is safe, it's efficacious, it provides better quality of care, or for the patient it is convenient and provides better access, then we want to remove the obstacles for the clinician or the patient from choosing this. Uh, so we're working on standardizing the regulatory approach across, as well as uh, reducing some of the barriers in terms of uh, costs and financials associated in terms of the choice that a patient might make. So the short answer to both is that we would like to see progress, um, both for hospitals as well as primary care, using telemedicine services appropriately, where it makes a difference to the clinical care, where it becomes more convenient and more um, acceptable to the patients. Mr. Dennis Tan. Question three, sir. Mr. Speaker, our approach to build a sustainable aviation fuel ecosystem strikes a balance between economic competitiveness and environmental sustainability. As explained in our announcement during the Changi Aviation Summit in February 2024, we will take into account developments such as the approaches of other air hubs towards sustainable aviation fuel adoption and the scale of sustainable aviation fuel production and availability of supply around the world before deciding on our sustainable aviation fuel target beyond 2026. Mr. Tan. Thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, I have uh, three supplementary questions. 
Uh, number one, will the government consider mandating for airlines arriving and departing Singapore to publish their percentage use of sustainable aviation fuel and emissions reduced as a result uh, to promote greater consumer demand for greener flights? Uh, number two, when determining the reduction of emissions from the use of uh, sustainable aviation fuel, will the government take into account the type of fuel used and certain types of fuel uh, such as crop-based fuel may lead to greater conversion of forest or grassland and release stored carbon, resulting in greater production emissions. And uh, number three, will the government study plans uh, by other countries with higher sustainable air fuel, uh, aviation fuel targets such as Britain and Japan and the EU to raise our projected targets even further? Thank you. Minister Chi. Mr. Speaker, uh, the flights that are departing Singapore, uh, I think that's where the Sustainable Aviation Fuel or SAF requirement uh, will be imposed. And so if the flights are coming in from another country, then it will be for the authorities in that airport that the flights are departing to impose this on the departing flights. Uh, types of fuel, certainly uh, there are standards, uh, including by ICAO, looking at what are the uh, fuels that will qualify as sustainable aviation fuel, and Singapore will uh, take reference from these international standards. And lastly, um, I have also mentioned in the announcement during the Changi Aviation Summit that the 1% target that we are starting with in 2026 is a first step. Uh, we will continue to monitor international developments and look at um, what we want to do for the subsequent steps. But I think it is important to strike a balance between achieving reductions in carbon emissions on one hand and also, I think, protecting the competitiveness of our air hub on the other hand. Both are important. And uh, one very key factor, Mr. Speaker, would be what would be the production um, and supply capacity globally. So we hope that with Singapore and also other authorities around the world uh, sending a signal to producers that we want them to invest in new production capacity. Uh, this will help to raise the level of uh, production globally. Mr. Dennis Tan. Question for sir. Sir, so, HDB conducts credit assessments to gauge the financial ability of loan applicants to service monthly mortgage instalments based on the applicant's income. The assessment is carried out when the applicant applies for HDB flat eligibility letter or HFE letter. It is based on the applicant's average monthly income over a period of 12 months. All applicants, regardless of the nature of the employment, are required to provide their CPF contribution history and latest notice of assessment for income tax through MyInfo. HDB will reach out to applicants if further supporting documents are needed. Unlike employed persons who generally receive monthly CPF contributions from work that can be used to pay mortgage instalments, self-employed persons typically pay their mortgage instalments fully in cash. Hence, they are required to provide their credit bureau report and bank statements for an assessment on their, of their financial position and their ability to pay their mortgage instalments every month. Mr Tan. Thank the SMS for the answer. Um, <clears throat> Uh, does and will the HDB give different considerations in their assessment of the income of self-employed to take into account that um, the business owner or the self-employed may not pay themselves um, regularly? And so, for example, would the HDB take into account uh, on the um, declared uh, uh, an annual income as declared to uh, IRAS? And number two, where the business income may vary for example, even a short period of time where a self-employed uh, business uh, income trajectory increases considerably, will, uh, can the HDB exercise some flexibility to look actually at the upward trend of the income at the time of the application? Thank you. 
I said, Ms. Tan? Sir, the short answer to the member's question is that HDB uh, will review on case by case basis, case, be, uh, case by case basis, if the applicant has some uh, specific circumstance. The underlying principle is really to make sure that whoever is buying a flat, applying for HDB flat, can service the monthly mortgage payments. And that is why we have an income assessment criteria looking at different eligibility uh, of the income. And the details are on HDB's website, what form of income will be considered. And I mentioned earlier about the IRA statements and the CPF contributions. These are all taken in totality. So if the member has um, you know, come across cases where the applicant requires certain flexibility on case-by-case -case review, please flag to HDB and we'll take a look. Mr. Hong Wing. Question five, sir. Mr. Speaker, MOE works closely with the social service agencies to attract and retain special education or SPED educators to meet the growing demand for SPED teachers, teacher aides, allied professionals and vocational educators in SPED schools. There are ongoing recruitment efforts to attract university graduates and diploma holders from diverse backgrounds with the relevant skills, competencies and dispositions, including efforts in partnering institutions of higher learning. Beyond recruitment, MOE is also committed to strengthening the SPED sector as a system. First, we launched the Journeys of Excellence package in 2020 to strengthen the professionalism of SPED teachers. This package comprised a SPED teacher career and competency framework and training roadmap to provide clarity on career progression as well as roles and expectations. In 2022, we enhanced the Diploma in Special Ed Education, or DICE, to better equip SPED teachers with the necessary skills and competencies. Participation in DICE is a requirement for all SPED teachers and is sponsored by MOE. MOE will increase funding to SPED schools between 2024 and 2026 to raise the average salaries for teachers and teacher aides to maintain market competitiveness and strengthen the professionalism of the SPED sectors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Yip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his uh, response. I just have a very short uh, SQ. Uh, will the Ministry consider exploring alternative pathways into special uh, needs education, such as attracting professionals with relevant experience from other fields through conversion programs? Thank you. Minister Maliki. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the short answer is yes. We welcome anyone who is keen to join the SPED sector. We know this SPED sector is a very challenging sector to be in. It requires determination. It requires passion. It is a calling. So we welcome Mr. Ip's um, suggestion and we will look into various ways and work with the social service agencies who are operating the SPED school to encourage a lot more people, even through conversion, if there are interested individuals to do so and they are keen to participate in the training program. As mentioned earlier, we have developed a framework for them to go through professional development, including the starting course, uh, which is a diploma in special education. Thank you. Ms. Tingru. Question 6, please. Mr. Speaker, in January 2022, the government announced the introduction of the carbon tax transition framework to provide time for Singapore companies in the emissions intensive and trade exposed or EITE sectors to adjust to a low carbon economy and to make the necessary investments for the transformation. Since the announcement, EDB has been engaging affected companies, such as those in the chemicals and semiconductor sectors, on the details and implementation of the framework. The transition framework will be calibrated to spur companies to invest in decarbonisation. Transitory allowances will be provided only for a proportion, only for a proportion of the company's emissions. And they are based on internationally recognised efficiency benchmarks where available or the company's decarbonisation plans the remaining emissions will be subject to the prevailing headline carbon tax. The government will review 
and will adjust the allowances based on how companies have fed in lowering their emissions, as well as international developments and advancements in decarbonisation technologies. For the Energy Efficiency Fund, or E2F, 90 projects amounting to 3.4 million Singapore dollars have been approved to date. The Energy Efficiency Fund has been subsumed under the Enhanced Energy Efficiency Grant, or EEG, just two days ago, from the 1st of April 2024, which will be available to more companies. Thank you. Ms. Her. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your reply. I have two SQs. The first is uh, the Minister uh, 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 said earlier that uh, EDB has been engaging affected companies. I was just wondering how many companies have been reached by EDB and uh, does he have an estimate about how, how many uh, companies have not yet been um, uh, engaged by EDB and you know, how, how many more to go, basically? Um, the second question is, um, is there any significant projected impact from the transition framework on Singapore's climate targets that arise from this, from the framework? Thank you. Minister Tan. I thank the member for a supplementary question. Um, for the first one, under this transition framework, HDB, uh, EDB has been engaging um, the types of facilities in the energy intensive, um, uh, the EIT sectors. Uh, they are actually sectorally uh, determined. So we have them in the chemicals, electronics, and biomedical manufacturing sectors. These will receive transitory allowances. Now, as to the number of companies. Today, there are more than, uh, you, you can imagine, these are actually large sector companies. More than uh, 20 companies, and the list will continue to be uh, populated, but thus far, more than 20 companies. The level of allowances, of course, with EDB's involvement, will factor in the company's decarbonisation plans, as well as benchmarking to internationally recognised efficiency benchmarks wherever it's applicable. Now, in time, when appropriate, the government will release aggregated information on the amount of allowances provided. But this is where I want to also sound a caution. We will need to bear in mind considerations such as whether these disclosures will inadvertently divulge commercially sensitive information because I think you can imagine that in the energy and chemical sector itself uh, there, there are that number of players within Jurong Island and, and, and within the, the entire sort of space itself. What, what was your second um, question? Sorry, the second question is, the, what is, the, if, is, there, is if there is a significant projected impact on the transition framework on Singapore's climate targets? We want to also be able to spur um, and continue to, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, just to answer the second uh, SQ. We want to spur, continue to nudge companies to decarbonize ahead of time. And uh, we are mindful and we are very focused on achieving that target by 2050. Because this is really a developing framework and the companies that we are engaging in, they are also looking at international benchmarks. In time to come, in about a year from now, I think we will be able to give you a better, a clearer indication. I, I, I seek your patience on this. Thank you. Dr. Tan Wu Ming. <clears throat> Speaker, sir, the Central Depository Private Limited CDP is licensed by MAS under the Securities and Futures Act of 2001 as an approved clearinghouse and a central depository system to provide securities clearing, settlement and depository services. MAS expects all MAS licensed financial institutions to treat their customers fairly, including availing <coughs> effective support and feedback channels. At least 99% of all CDP's customers access CDP's services digitally or over calls. Since September 2022, less digitally savvy customers can access self-help booths at CDP's SGX Vista premises to submit physical documents or to seek in-person assistance. 
They also have the option to book an in-person appointment with CDP via its customer hotline. CDP service representatives also take additional care by providing priority assistance or in-person meetings to customers who have previously indicated difficulty accessing its digital services. MAS expects CDP to address feedback about the adequacy of its non-digital customer support and also to closely monitor the performance of its customer service. Dr. Tan. I thank the Minister for his answer. I've got two supplementary questions on behalf of my Clementi residents. Firstly, when MAS sets the service standards for the central depository, are these service standards also benchmarked against what a retail bank might provide to its customers? Because we have Clementi residents, residents from Faber Hills in Clementi who are elderly, prefer face-to-face -face interactions, and are still quite worried about access to counter service when transacting with the central depository. So the first question is, is the standard of service prescribed different compared to a retail bank which, like CDP, would have many legacy customers who are older and not so digitally savvy? My second question <coughs> pertains to whether or not the customers who are sent digital notices to provide information to keep their accounts open, do these customers also receive telephone calls or paper physical letters if they don't respond. And I ask this because I have a Clementi resident, retired stockbroker, his central depository trading account was suspended because he didn't use the online system to update his particulars. My resident says he's not computer literate, doesn't own a PC. So can the minister confirm whether CDP's practices include telephone and paper physical letter outreach before someone's trading account is suspended with potential implications if they need to access that account urgently at a future date. Thank you. MOS Tan. So I thank Dr. Tan Wu Ming for his SQ. Uh, Dr. Tan Wu Ming has been speaking um, very passionately about CDP and he's raised many of these uh, discrete cases with me. Uh, on the CDP account openings or suspensions or access to digital services. Um, and both he and I have been working on these cases on behalf of his Clementi residents. Uh, on the specific case in, in point, um, from what I understand is that the particular senior had provided an email uh, address and therefore CDP had provided, uh, had reminded the senior to uh, update his particulars, um, and that's prior warning before account suspension. Uh, we have been dealing with that case also, um, and now the account has been restored. So that's for that. Uh, on, the, uh, on his first point, I had mentioned in my earlier reply that MAS expects all MAS licensed financial institutions to treat customers fairly, including all of the effective support uh, and feedback channels. That includes CDP. But I also wanted to uh, commend uh, the member as well because uh, of many of his suggestions over the years uh, and just update him on a few uh, aspects in which there have been enhancements uh, to CDP uh, as a result of um, MAS engagements with CDP to avail more uh, in-person uh, uh, channels to those that are less digitally uh, literate. Uh, one point to note is that uh, at least 99% of all CDP customers access its services digitally or over calls. So that means that a vast majority are digitally savvy, but as a member knows, the government's position is that we're not going to be uh, digital only, but we want to adopt a digital first approach. Therefore, CDP uh, has uh, made a couple of different enhancements over the years. First, uh, in granting uh, in-person appointments via uh, at the SGX Vista premises. Second is to provide instant video conferencing services with CDP service representatives. They've also published user guides and instructional videos on the internet and social media. And there's also a new chatbot on SGX website. That's it. 
uh, there is always scoop, scope for improvements on to CDP's customer's journey, including particularly for those that are less digitally savvy. And I wanted to assure Dr. Tan that MAS continues to engage C CDP to address uh, many of the customer's pain points across the user journey, particularly relating to those in in-person appointments and customer uh, statements. So finally also, if a particular customer uh, wants a, a physical uh, notice by post, uh, he or she can also make that uh, request and CDP will see. Thank you. Dr. Tan, Dr. Tan, next question. Yeah. The World Health Organization and Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations have indicated in their respective reports in 2022 that there is insufficient data to fully understand the impact of microplastics and nanoplastics on human health. Nonetheless, we are closely monitoring international discussions and scientific studies on this topic. Microplastics and nanoplastics can be produced from the breakdown of larger plastic debris. We have implemented measures to reduce plastic waste as well as minimize the potential contribution of plastic debris into the environment and marine waters through, from land-based sources. These include robust waste management systems, a strict anti-littering enforcement regime, and measures to encourage businesses and individuals to reduce the consumption of single-use plastics. 2024 is designated as a year of public hygiene. We are increasing efforts to work with stakeholders <coughs> to enhance cleanliness and address littering, including of plastic waste. We urge everyone to do your part to keep plastic litter from entering our environment. Dr. Tan. I thank the SMS for her answer. I've got two supplementary questions. The first question is on whether or not our agencies are actively doing horizon scans of the medical and scientific literature. And further to that, may I draw Minister's attention to an article published in the international peer-reviewed journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, 7th of March, 2024, entitled, and I quote, microplastics and nanoplastics in atheromas and cardiovascular events, end quote. In summary, the research article looks at whether microplastics and nanoplastics can be found in the blood vessels of persons who are unwell, and if they correlate with future risk of cardiovascular illness. So can I ask secondly to the minister, Although it is still early days, and although this is just one study published in an international peer-reviewed journal, will the Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment work with MOH and other health agencies to get a sense of what the evolving evidence is on this so that Singapore can move and make decisions in a timely way as our understanding evolves regarding the science? Thank you. SMS call. Thank the member for his uh, supplementary questions as well as uh, comments. Um, let me say that indeed um, there is a growing momentum uh, on this issue uh, and um, this issue has been the subject of uh, various uh, international studies and research uh, and as a member has cited, this is one of the research that has been undertaken. Um, but as I've noted, uh, currently, uh, say based on the uh, WHO report that I cited earlier, uh, 2022 report, uh, the report has uh, stated that the current global evidence uh, on the impact of uh, micro and nanoplastics on health risk is still inconclusive uh, and more data is needed uh, to better understand uh, human exposure as well as then to characterize and quantify uh, human health risks. Uh, so 
even uh, studies like uh, what the member has cited actually also concludes that uh, further research uh, has to be done. So indeed, uh, MSE and MOH and uh, various relevant agencies are working closely together yes. to better understand <coughs> uh, and monitor the <coughs> impact of uh, such environmental pollutants, ma uh, ma uh, microplastics and nanoplastics on human health. Uh, and we will continue, as I've said, to track uh, international studies and research uh, in this area. And we are open to uh, uh, you know, considering support uh, on relevant and useful research uh, on this topic. Uh, but having said that, uh, in the meantime, uh, we will continue to look at how we can reduce uh, you know, plastic waste as well as the amount of uh, plastic debris that gets into the environment and marine waters through our waste management systems, uh, anti-littering uh, enforcement regime, and getting businesses and individuals to also reduce uh, plastic waste uh, created. And as assurance, let me also say that PUB, for instance, actually undertakes or has been undertaking biannual surveillance uh, of the presence of microplastics in water from our four national taps since 2017. And as of the latest test results in 2023, we have not detected any microplastics in the treated water. And we will continue to monitor uh, 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 developments in this area. Mr. Liang Enghua. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, MOE and MSF track the enrolment of students in school-based and community-based student care centres or SECs. All 182 primary schools have SECs with a total enrolment of about 33,000 students. There are about 190 community-based SECs that are registered with MSF with a total enrolment of about 8,300 students. MOE regularly engages school-based SECs on their programs. School-based SECs are required to provide weekly outdoor programs and enrichment activities, including reading, speech and drama, creative writing, music and art, to develop values, social, emotional and 21st century competencies in our students. All registered community-based SECs are required to meet standards stipulated by MSF, which includes providing structured daily program for their students. These SECs have the flexibility to offer programs and additional enrichment activities to meet the needs of their students. Mr. Leong. Thank you, sir. Uh, it has been quite a number of years since we uh, introduced the SECs. Uh, I believe it still serves a good purpose, <clears throat> especially for latch key kids uh, whose parents are working. Uh, now that this has been uh, implemented for a number of years, uh, can I ask the MOS if <clears throat> MOE would do a, a fresh review uh, to see if the programs uh, can be updated further or can be enhanced? Uh, and especially given now the emphasis uh, on uh, to embrace uh, learning beyond grades, you know, whether the SEC can also be aligned to that as well. And where is gone? The short answer is yes. We will continue to review the programs offered at our school-based SECs. MOE recognises the importance of holistic development of our students and, as mentioned, our school-based SECs provide outdoor programmes, enrichment activities to develop values and 21st century competencies in our students. And this is in line with our direction to go beyond grades. Schools also work with SECs and community partners to support learning and development of our students in different ways. For example, National Library Board conducts reading programs to cultivate love for reading in our students. RSVP Singapore organises interest-based activities to engage our SEC students so that they are imparted with life skills and values. Mr Leung. So can I just follow up with another question about uh, whether the demands continue to be there. Uh, the, the, the MOS mentioned 33,000 for school base and 8,000 for the uh, community base. Uh, whether you, we see more higher demand and uh, whether there will be more SEC to be provided, if, if so. MOS can. 
But both MOE and MSF together monitor very closely the enrolment of students in both the school-based SECs as well as the community-based SECs. As of now, uh, most SECs don't have a wait list or they have very short wait lists. Thank you. Ms. Rachel Ong. Question 10, please. The Tripartite Committee on Workplace Fairness has completed its work and issued its final recommendations in August 2023. I want to assure the member that the committee had consulted widely, including with SG and ABLE and various other community groups representing persons with disabilities. The committee took into account the feedback and recommended prohibiting workplace discrimination on the basis of disability and supporting employers who wish to hire persons with disabilities. The committee also recommended issuing a tripartite advisory on providing reasonable accommodations, which are adjustments to the job or the work environment that make it possible for employees with disabilities to perform their jobs. The tripartite partners will continue to engage the various community groups and SG and ABLE when developing this advisory. Mr. Liang Ying -Hua. Sir, from 2019 to 2023, HDB received an annual average of around 854,000 pieces of correspondence, which include appeals, feedback, and inquiries from members of the public. Appeals comprise a subset of these, averaging around 177,000 appeals per year. These appeals spanned a wide range of issues, such as eligibility for purchase of HDB flats, HDB housing loans and housing grants, housing maintenance issues, public rental housing, and parking offences. HDB takes into consideration the unique circumstances of each case when assessing appeals, and the outcome of each appeal will depend on their individual merits. MND and HDB regularly review our housing policies and schemes to ensure that we cater to the evolving needs and aspirations of Singaporean households and to meet national objectives. Mr. Leung. Uh, so, as MPs, we do send large number of appeals to HDB on behalf of residents, uh, and, and for me in particular, I, I think I can, I can account for about <coughs> up to half the total appeals that I send. So, the question is whether, uh, on one side, for the HDB as an organisation, uh, given the caseload, uh, uh, are HDB spending, uh, HDB staff spending a disproportionate amount of time. Uh, handling abuse, uh, which could have been spent otherwise on maybe on the ground to improve uh, or, or solve other problems. Uh, while on the other side, you know, the residents are having to wait for weeks or months for HDB to respond. Uh, uh, just a withdrawal of a name, of, uh, uh, someone who wanted to buy a flat to withdraw the names from a parent's flat may take you weeks or months to just to appeal. So can I ask the SMS, is this a case where the schemes are structured uh, just too tightly? and uh, are less flexible, uh, resulting in high numbers of appeals. And whether should HGB review uh, this, uh, the, the schemes to, to, to reduce the appeals? Or even for new schemes, whether to design it such that, uh, that to, with the aim to reduce the likelihood of appeals in mind uh, for newer schemes. Thank you. SMS in. I thank the member for his concern about the workload in HDB. And indeed, we are constantly looking for ways to streamline uh, our officers' workload so that their time can be spent more productively in serving Singaporeans. Uh, I believe the members' uh, interest will be in housing-related appeals, so I should uh, add that in the numbers that I have shared with him just now, it includes appeals for parking-related offences, uh, which constitute uh, approximately about 40% of the appeal load. Uh, now, housing-related uh, appeals would be the bulk of the remainder, and we will be reviewing our schemes uh, quite regularly to make sure that they meet uh, the evolving needs of Singaporeans. That said, uh, sometimes we do receive appeals uh, which 
uh, actually there is already a very clear framework. Uh, I'll give an example. For instance, um, residents or members of the public <coughs> appealing to ask for priority allocation of a BTO flat. I think this is quite familiar to members of this house. Uh, we have a very clear framework for the application of BTO. There is a ballot. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there will be members of the public who feel that um, they should get a priority uh, allocation of a flat or even direct allocation of a flat. Uh, and uh, much as we already have a framework in place, but if such an appeal comes, we will duly look at it and also reply. Uh, so that constitutes some of the volume. Uh, there are also cases where, because of the changing circumstances of the individual appellant, for instance, his financial circumstances. In fact, I believe the question just now uh, posed by Mr. Dennis Tan relates to this. And for deserving cases, we should look at uh, and also then uh, look at these appeals and uh, mm -hmm. provide an answer accordingly. Uh, so I think outside of these cases where either actually there already is a framework uh, and the members of the public know it, but they want to appeal nonetheless, uh, or cases where uh, because of changing circumstances, we do need the appeals process in order to ensure that the outcome is fair uh, for the member of the public, uh, we will nonetheless continue to review and streamline our schemes wherever possible. Mr. Louis Chua, in 12, please. <coughs> Sir, golfing is a land intensive sport, and there's a need to balance the allocation of land to the sport vis a vis the competing demands for land in Singapore, such as for public housing. We recognize that it is important for the public to have continued access to the sport. The government is looking at how we can ensure continued access to golf courses. In the near term, we have made available options to provide for public access to golfing. First, the operator of the Mandai Executive Golf Course has been granted a two-year tenancy extension until December 2026. Second, Taking into consideration the impending closure of the 18-hole public course at Marina Bay Golf Course, the government had earlier worked with Keppel Club to set aside slots at the Syme Golf Course for public use at an affordable price range comparable to other public courses. Currently, the majority of slots at the Keppel Syme Course on both weekdays as well as weekends are set aside for members of the public. The government will also look into the feasibility of public golfing facilities for the longer term, bearing in mind other needs of Singaporeans at the same time. Mr Chua. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, SPS uh, Eric Chua for the update. Uh, I certainly concur with the view that, especially in Singapore, where land size constraints is an issue, it is not an efficient use of space, but um, certainly also agree with the view that uh, accessibility and affordability to all sports is important. And I just wonder if uh, the SPS can share if in the next couple of years, when it comes to lease extension agreements for the private golf clubs, whether a view to public accessibility can be a feature in these agreements. Thank you. SPS Chua. Mr. Speaker, I think the short answer to Mr. Chua's question is yes, and we do take that into account, especially in the near term. We take that into account both for the near term as well as for the longer term. In the near term, we are working with um, Capital Club to see if more slots could be made available. So, for instance, we are exploring the possibility of introducing night golfing at the Capital Simon course, for instance. In the longer term, we will explore all other various options um, to make sure that public accessibility is uh, one of our key considerations in doing this. Mr. Chao Giam. Question 13, please. Mr. Speaker, the Singapore Police Force, or SPF, has not been tracking the number of such cases. While we have received some reports where the complainants had alleged that voice cloning techniques were used by the scammers, the number is not high. Regardless of scam typology, 
the SPF works closely with stakeholders such as local, local telecommunication companies and messaging application companies to prevent criminals from using our communication channels as conduit for scams. In 2023, more than 9,200 mobile lines and more than 29,200 WhatsApp lines, which were believed to be used in scams, were submitted for termination. In addition, the Infocom Media Development Authority, or IMDA, will soon be imposing limits on the number of postpaid SIM cards per subscriber. As we have mentioned several times in the House, the fight against scams requires a whole of society effort. The industry needs to play its part. For example, social media platforms and messaging apps should introduce enhanced user verification measures to weed out inauthentic accounts and prevent scammers from abusing them to perpetrate scams. On its part, the public has to remain vigilant and take the necessary steps to act against scams. First, add. Everyone should make a proactive effort to add security features to their devices to protect themselves against scams. For example, add antivirus software and update our mobile devices with the latest security patches. Second, check. When receiving a phone call or message asking for your personal information, banking credentials, or for money transfers, always check and verify separately, even if the other party sounds like someone you know. Third, tell. Tell the authorities about your scam encounters. If you suspect that you have fallen prey to a scam, call and tell your bank immediately and ask the bank to activate the kill switch to protect your banking account. If, which, if each of us play our part, we can collectively have a better chance of reducing our losses to scammers. Mr. Giam. I think the MOS first reply. Can I clarify how many voice cloning scam reports were actually received by the police in the past year? Uh, secondly, there are now AI systems that can clone a person's voice after listening to them speak for as little as just three seconds. Scammers can use this cloned voice to trick friends and family members of these persons into transferring money to them. I recently checked the scam alert telegram channel and website, but don't see any mention of voice cloning schemes. Do the National Crime Prevention Council and other agencies plan to educate Singaporeans about this new scam and how to protect themselves? For example, not assuming that the familiar voice on the other end of the line is the person they know, and by establishing a common passcode among family members. And lastly, does MHA scan the horizon for new scam technologies and start to make crime prevention, start to take crime prevention measures before the first police reports start coming in? Yeah. So I thank the member for the uh, SQ. As I said, numbers, uh, number is small. Uh, with regard to the uh, education efforts and scam technologies, uh, yes, we continue to update and also look at how we uh, work with the different stakeholders in the community, including the public. And at the same time, we also are developing our capabilities. For example, uh, we are developing technical measures in collaboration with the industry. Uh, for example, the Home Team Science and Technology Agency, HDX, has been developing detection methods for both video and audio deepfakes using artificial intelligence, including the capability to detect voice cloning. And in addition, MCI and ASTAR will officially launch the Center for Advanced Technologies in Online Safety uh, in the first half of this year. The center will be a platform to bring together our community of research partners, companies, and practitioners in Singapore to build capabilities for a safer internet. Such capabilities may include tools and measures to detect harmful content, such as deepfakes and non-factual claims, inject watermarks or trace the origin of digital content, and 
empower vulnerable groups with resources to verify information they encounter online. So essentially, we will do our part to uh, enhance our capabilities as the scammers themselves do so. Uh, however, as I shared earlier, it's important for us to continue to engage the ground. And I'm pleased to share that uh, even at the different MPCs, I can see the police officers engaging the ground from common layperson to uh, people with knowledge of it so that the whole society is being protected. Because uh, I think it's an, for the scammers, this is an, it's an opportunity for them to, to commit crimes or to get steal money from people. Uh, but on our part, we have to protect our people. So we will continue to work hard to engage the whole society. Ms. Jinsi. Mission Fortin. Mr. Speaker, arts, design, media, ADM graduates have seen stable employment outcomes and wage increases over the years. In the last 10 years, the average employment rate for ADM graduates was around 88% and the starting salary increased about 3.4% every year. The employment rate and salary level for fresh graduates in this sector are typically lower compared to their peers who join other sectors such as engineering, built environment and business. This is reflective of the economic demand and the labour market conditions of each sector. The nature of work and business structures in the ADM sector also mean that there is a high proportion of freelancers and self-employed persons compared to other sectors. Under our SG Arts Plan 2023-2027, to the National Arts Council is taking active steps to grow capabilities and excellence in the arts sector and support the training and development of self-employed persons. The Infocom Media Development Authority, IMDA, and Design Singapore Council, DSG, have also been working closely with the universities and key industry partners to provide our graduates with a good education and relevant in-demand skill sets to take on good jobs and thrive in the workplace. Design Singapore Council also facilitates partnerships between universities and companies, such as through the Design Education Advisory Committee to enhance industry exposure and internship opportunities for our students. As for health sciences graduates, while the growth in median salaries over the past 10 years has been lower than the other graduates from the universities, it increased by 6% in 2023, which was higher than the average increase for university graduates in general. The Ministry of Health continues to work with healthcare clusters to review the starting salary and salary package of healthcare workers on a regular basis to ensure that the salaries remain competitive. MOH also provided funding support to the community care sector over the last 10 years to uplift salaries and most recently put out salary guidelines for the sector. To support all students and graduates as they enter the workforce, our universities organise career fairs and have career coaches to provide mentoring and workshops. Graduates can also approach Workforce Singapore's Careers Connect or NTUC's E2I career centres if they require support in their job search. At the same time, we encourage our students to consider longer-term factors such as career progression, salary and growth opportunities in the sector as they pursue their passion and decide on the course of study in the universities. Missy. Thank you, MOS. Uh, I have two supplementary questions. So the first is relating to the arts and design. Um, I do understand that if we look at arts and design from a vertical, as a vertical skill, then that in terms of opportunities is quite confined. But uh, I'm just wanting to maybe follow up on some of the uh, mentions in my previous budget speech. Looking at the growth of various sectors such as tourism, um, entertainment, etc. in Singapore, where in terms of growth potential, and economic opportunities are much more. What would be steps taken to integrate these uh, creative arts professionals in these fields with actually these growth industries? So that's one. Second, for health sciences, I also do understand that there is a big push for actually healthier SG. Uh, what are the opportunity spaces in which the schools are looking at to bridge 
these graduates with the opportunities upstream, with, uh, on stream. Thank you. Hey, Mois Khan. Well, certainly agree with both points. Um, for the arts and design graduates, um, just for information, they don't just go to arts and design jobs um, from the data that we have collected. Uh, many of them actually go into public relations, product um, uh, design, advertising, sales, marketing, graphic design, tourism, and many more. So indeed, uh, in our education, we hope to equip our students with both broad-based as well as vertical skill sets so that they have more opportunities and um, career choices when they graduate. For health sciences, um, yes, Healthier SG is an exciting development. Uh, MOE will work very closely with MOH to make sure that the curriculum and the skills frameworks are updated so that our students will have maximal opportunities when they graduate. Thank you. Mr. Jogia. 15, please. Mr. Speaker, the government has not made any decisions regarding the deployment of nuclear energy in Singapore. As such, we have no plans for uranium stockpiling. Any deployment decision will require detailed studies of the safety, the reliability, the affordability, and also the environmental sustainability of nuclear energy in our local context. So what we're doing is steadily building capabilities to better understand and assess global developments on advanced nuclear energy technologies. Thank you. Mr. Kiam. Thank the Minister for his reply. Can I ask uh, how many scientists are currently at the Singapore Nuclear Research and Safety Initiative and how many scholarships are awarded each year to help build the pipeline of nuclear scientists and expertise? And uh, beyond technical capabilities, is the government building up the necessary regulatory policy frameworks that, would need, that will be needed to oversee potential nuclear energy programs for both, for both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion? And lastly, is there any timeline in which the government is going to take a position on this? Minister Tan. I thank the member for the supplementary question. I think he has asked about three of them. We, we did our last, our last nuclear energy pre-feasibility study in 2012. And since that pre-feasibility study, NUS has set up the Singapore Nuclear Safety and Research Initiative, or SNRZ, in 2014. And SNRZ focuses on research and capability development in nuclear safety, science and engineering. Uh, the government has also set up the Nuclear Safety Research and Education Program, or NSREP, under the RIE, the Research Innovation and Enterprise 2025 plan, to prepare Singapore to understand the implications of the evolution of nuclear energy technologies and regional nuclear energy developments for Singapore and also to enhance our operational preparedness. So to his first point in terms of the numbers, so the government supports efforts to train scientists and experts in local and overseas universities. Over the last decade, SNRZI has awarded 30 zero scholarships for postgraduate studies in areas related to nuclear science and engineering. Thus far, SNRZI has also developed a pipeline of around 40 researchers specialising in radiobiology, radiochemistry and nuclear safety. And we aim to build a pool of about 100 experts in the medium to long run. As for his last point on looking at nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, Maybe I can address nuclear fusion first. There is a lot of excitement in the fusion space, but to date, on a sustainable basis, the net energy input needed to create that nuclear fusion reaction far exceeds the output of the energy that we can harness. So the closest system that um, many of the countries all over the world have developed still is premised on the tokamak 
technology. Um, there is a promising new area which is done in Devon, Massachusetts in the US by Commonwealth Fusion Systems. They're developing this as a, as a sort of a co-development with the MIT Plasma Science Institute, um, and it's called Spark. It's a smaller scale uh, tokamak reactor. It uses uh, high uh, temperature super magnets to create that, that high temperatures is needed. To date, it is still a developmental project. The actual project has not come to fruition yet. So we are watching that space very closely. And we are, of course, in the process, um, we have also sort of sent members of the local Singapore team to go there and study how that, that technology is going to evolve. So for nuclear fusion, to answer that question, uh, I think it's still quite nascent and we are probably at least a decade away. For nuclear fusion, there are small modular reactors, uh, also generation four uh, thermal reactors, which potentially, potentially could suit our needs. So again, we have teams studying those technologies very closely, very intently. But today, again, there isn't a commercialized nuclear, a small modular nuclear reactor or a gen four thermal reactor for us to be able to learn from. So we watch that space very closely. Um, in our broad uh, approach, as I've said before, uh, nothing is off the table. We continue uh, to keep our options open to all kinds of low carbon energy, including, of course, nuclear energy, both fission and fusion. I hope that addresses your question. Mr. Guillaume. I thank the Minister for addressing my questions. Uh, just a last question. Uh, when is the government going to take a position on whether to, to use nuclear energy in our, in our energy mix in the future? Um, does, the government, does the Minister agree that it's important to provide some certainty or more certainty to both aspiring scientists and our people re with regard to the use of nuclear energy? Minister Tan. I think the, the member... Uh, presupposes that we have made a decision on nuclear energy. As I've earlier on when I addressed the PQ, I've said we have not made a decision. The member has to appreciate that very conventional nuclear reactors, the older versions, the generation one, generation two, the safety buffer zone is actually beyond even our radius or any part where you can talk about in Singapore. So we have to wait to a small modular reactor or the newer generation four type of thermal reactors to be deployed commercially and for us to understand the safety profile before we make a decision. However, we recognize the fact that radiological safety, um, the understanding of the operational capabilities, the engineering science behind it continues to be something that is important and relevant to us. Hence, we have not stopped training our local talent, training our local pipeline of talent, sending them overseas, attaching them to institutions all over, collaborating with them to learn and to adapt that expertise and imbibe the knowledge so that at some point in time when we have finally made the decision, we will then bring them back here. I think this is a very clear enough roadmap given the nascency of the commercialization of some of these newer generations type of small modular reactors. For fusion, as I said earlier on, today the net energy input put in to develop that, that fusion reaction is far more than what we are able to extract from it. So net net, it doesn't make sense for us, economic sense in any way for us to uh, go into that. But having said that, we are still, nonetheless, studying that, monitoring that space very closely. I think that's as far as we can tell you. We will not be able to commit to a particular timeline. But that doesn't mean that we stop looking at it. As I've said today, our pipeline in the medium to long term is 100 researchers at least. And for our own energy security, we also do not 
rest on one or two technologies. I said nothing is off the table. We have improved the diversification of our sources of procurement for natural gas. I think I've spent a lot of hours in this house explaining, expounding why we need to, to, to diversify our, our gas sources. We have also gone into RFPs, request for proposal. We have given conditional approvals for up to four gigawatts of low carbon energy imports from around the region. We are also exploring potentially geothermal uh, energy sources within our country itself. We are also piloting a new Pathfinder project uh, for ammonia end-to-end, -end, from bunkering to uh, the generation of, of electricity using ammonia, with a view that ultimately, once technologies for a more economical means of transportation of low carbon or green hydrogen can be established, we will also go and use that as one of the sources for us to generate power as well. So those are the, the, the different um, you know, sort of uh, uh, alternatives that we are now exploring on top of also keeping our eyes on nuclear energy. I hope that gives you that reassurance. Thank you. Mr. Melvin Young. The Singapore Food Agency, SFA, is implementing the new Visitor Management System, or VMS, at Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centre, the PPWC, in phases. As the PPWC is an important node in our food supply chain, the VMS aims to enhance safety and security on, the, on premises and facilitate contact tracing and site management in the event of emergencies and future pandemics. Now, this is one of the very important lessons that we learned uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have to do this in order to protect the interests of the tenants, the public, as well as our food security. Now, the system is being implemented in phases, beginning with the PPWC-based operators and tenants uh, from sometime this month onwards, to allow them time to adapt to the new system. Uh, any other external visitors visiting the site will only be required to register under the VMS in a much later phase. So this will be done in progressive stages. We want to make sure that the tenants are comfortable. And to facilitate a smooth transition, SFA has been engaging the Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centre Association and the storeholders, made trial VMS kiosks available at PPWC and conducted user demonstration practice sessions. I personally tried registering myself through the on-site kiosk as well. It's very simple. It takes actually less than about maybe 10, 20 seconds if you scan your SING pass on the uh, kiosk itself, most of the information will be populated. All you need to do is key in your contact number, like your phone number, and, and then you're done. Once a user is registered, the regist registration details are, will be valid for a whole year, so the, any future visits to the place within the year will not require new registration. So the process will be very much quite hassle-free. Uh, the user then just needs to scan your SING pass or your ID on the gantry itself, and you can very quickly enter the premises. So I think that's something that uh, I hope would reassure the tenants and users that it will not be a system that will be too cumbersome. Um, as the various phases are implemented, SFA will review the operation of the system, take into account feedbacks and any adjustments that is needed to make changes uh, so that any kinks or any uh, inconveniences can be minimized as much as possible. Our aim is to make sure we work with our stakeholders to strike a balance between security and operational interests of PPWC, storeholders and the public. Mr. Yong. I thank the SMS for his reply and also his assurances that he's working closely with the uh, Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centres uh, Association. I think while the intent is clear and the objectives are understandable, uh, I think he has also said that we should strive to strike a balance between uh, security and also the daily operations because the wholesale centre has a whole range of uh, users uh, from the staff working there, which is quite, quite, quite a number, and also the logistic personnel that uh, 
delivers as well as fetch and distributes the, the, the goods there, and also uh, retail consumers that goes there to buy. I understand that even without the system, uh, during the peak hours of operations, the traffic conditions are already quite, quite a problem. So we really hope that uh, the SFA will work very closely to, to monitor that it doesn't, the traffic doesn't become uh, worse because of the system. I saw that the Immigration and Checkpoints Authority recently rolled out a QR code system uh, for immigration clearance at our land checkpoints. The feedback so far seems to have been positive. So would the SFA consider a similar system uh, for the Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centre and any of the, the other uh, Jurong Fishery port that, that you're planning to, to do to sort of expedite the access clearance? SMS call. So I thank Mr. Melvin Young for raising this uh, suggestion to consider a QR code. Um, I think we are all mindful that uh, it is a very busy place with many different stakeholders going in and out, the high human traffic and also high vehicle traffic. So the approach we take is going to be a gradual one. We start with the uh, tenants who has to be there regularly on a daily basis, as well as the workers who are permanently working there. And we will track how many of them has already pre-registered. Now, the registration need not be done at the kiosk on site. In fact, you can do it online. So actually, uh, you don't need to be congested at the guard room trying to register. We can do it online in the comfort of your home or your office. And once that is done, that registration will be valid for a whole year. And then there will be no further queues needed at the point of entry, except to produce your NRIC or your uh, SIM pass on your mobile phone, something which most of us will carry anyway. Um, when it comes to vehicles, I think it will be the same approach. Uh, delivery pe personnel who is regularly uh, coming to the place because most tenants will know who are their upstream suppliers and who are their downstream customers. We will give time for the tenants to engage their upstream and downstream uh, stakeholders to make sure that they are given time to pre-register themselves online so that when these personnel who are not actually physically working there on a regular basis do come frequently enough to pick up or to deliver items, they can then be processed quite quickly by just scanning the NRIC and a tap, a couple of seconds, the entry opens and they can enter. For drivers who are actually entering the premises, they actually need not even get off their vehicle uh, because at the um, normal gantry, the ERP gantry, uh, where you, you, know, you go to the gantry and you get the uh, fees being charged on your, on your ERP devices in your vehicle, actually we have uh, mounted a similar tapping uh, sensor on the, uh, on the gantry itself. So a driver just needs to reach the gantry as the fees are deducted for the per entry charge or the uh, exit charge. The, you wind down your window, you tap your IC on the sensor that is actually also mounted at the height of the windows and you can just then drive through without having to disembark on the vehicle. So this is a way in which we'll facilitate traffic flow without uh, increasing congestion. But as I said, we will do this in phases. We want to settle the human traffic first, and then we will implement the vehicle part when we are quite certain that the tenants have already tried to engage most of the upstream and downstream uh, stakeholders so that they won't come there and be surprised by it. Uh, and the final phase will then involve the rest of the uh, public, by which time we hope to have sent out enough information and make the public aware that should they want to turn up, they should pre-register on, uh, online and all must be prepared to uh, bring their IDs for registration with the kiosk uh, at the guard room <coughs> itself. So I hope that reassures the member that we are, we are considering this very carefully. We will continue to engage the uh, stakeholders there. And uh, if there is uh, a way to use... Um, other convenient technology like perhaps a QR code, we can consider that. But as I said, because we're using IDs that are already uh, physically all of us have, there may not really be a need to duplicate another new, uh, new step by generating a QR code that someone has to go find again. Yeah, thank you very much. Ms. Chinsey. Should be question 17. Sorry, question 17. Mr. Speaker, some sports facilities in our institutes of higher learning are available for public use today. For example, tennis and badminton courts in the National University of Singapore are part of the dual-use scheme, DUS, while several stadium-based running tracks in our other IHLs are open to public during operating hours. Outside of regular teaching hours, 
some IHLs do rent out their facilities, for example, lecture theatres and classrooms for continuing and education training programmes that are run by external training providers or events. Missy? Um, I do, thank you, MOS. I do understand that um, there would, there's actually increase in demand for various facilities because of um, the resumption of activities post-COVID, as well as also Healthier SG and various initiatives um, at the community level. Would there be intention to look at uh, on a broad base, um, not just so for both sports as well as non-sport use, whether there could be a more systematic way in which these facilities can be made available for different users. I do understand that there is a certain workflow for sports activities, but for non-sports activities, would there be uh, perhaps a more systematic way in which these facilities can be made available to different groups for booking? Thank you. And more is gone. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned in my reply, um, selected sports facilities in our IHLs are available to the public today. Um, other sports facilities in our IHLs uh, could be heavily utilised by students, staff, alumni and their community partners after school hours and even on weekends for co-curricular activities and campus events. An important consideration for whether these facilities are suitable to be placed um, under dual use scheme for public use will be whether there are physical boundaries that allow separate access points to the sports facilities. This is for the sake of operational safety and security. Um, as for non-sports facilities, um, Tamasic Polytechnic and NTU actually lease their facilities to external training providers to run private programs. Nevertheless, members of public or other organisations may approach our IHLs directly to request to lease lecture theatres, classroom facilities for activities, Healthier SG included, if they wish to. Mr Lewison. So I thank the member for raising this BQ because he's quite passionate about this topic and has asked this several times before. Um, now, while the Employment Act stipulates a minimum entitlement of seven days of annual leave, this increases by one day per year of service with the same employer. And in 2022, over 90% of full-time resident employees aged 24, uh, age 25 to 64 had more than seven days of annual leave. In addition, 64.6% of full-time resident employees aged 25 to 64 had 15 days or more of annual leave, higher than the 61.1% in 2018. Now, annual leave entitlements must be seen alongside other entitlements that similarly support employees in balancing their work and personal needs. These include paid public holidays, sick leave and parental leave, which we have just recently enhanced. Beside employees' needs, reviews of leave entitlements must also take into account the impact on business costs. There are no plans to review the annual leave entitlements for now, but we encourage more employers to review their employment benefits holistically to better attract and retain talent in our currently tight labour market. Thank you, sir. Ms. Ng. Uh, thank you, sir. I thank SMS for the reply. Uh, first, could I just check whether MOM is concerned that by increasing the minimum annual, annual leave entitlement, it will result in, in a, a lower productivity in the company? Because I, I think it might be the other way, that a more well-rested workforce will be a more productive workforce. Uh, second, I think three years ago, SMS uh, shared in this house that uh, the worry is that increasing annual leave entitlement would entail business costs. It's been three years, so I did give SMS a, a good break. Uh, uh, could he just share an update on, on what exactly are these business costs? And also whether taking my, into account my first point where a more well-rested workforce will be a more productive workforce and that might actually negate some of these business costs that MOM is concerned about. Thank you. SMS call. So I thank the member for his questions. Now, uh, the issue of giving more entitled leave and raising business costs is not something straightforward. But I think it's, uh, if you look at it from a very simplistic way, if more people do go on more leave, then the company's operations will require some backfilling, which may, may then require them to actually hire more extra people 
to actually backfill the persons who are on leave. <coughs> so in that more direct way, you can look at it as uh, raising some form of business cost. But I think when we talk about being more productive, uh, be, having more leave itself is not the only way to have people getting more rest and therefore becoming more productive. Productivity can come from many ways, <coughs> to better training, better redesign of the job, um, and better equipment, for example, for those that need to perform manual tasks. And we are looking at this from a more holistic way by ensuring that there are avenues for other forms of work arrangements, including flexible work arrangements, and also equipping uh, our workers with better skills and leveraging on technology to be a, a multiplier of productivity. So all this will work in concert to make sure that the person or the workers themselves are able to be more productive while actually also ensuring that there is a flexible arrangement to allow them to have more balance of their work needs as well as personal needs. So we're looking at it more from a, a multiple angle rather than just fixing the problem with more entitled annual leave. Mr. Ng. Thank you. So just, just one follow-up. I, I think the, the concern is that while, while some have the luxury of flexible work arrangements, and I fought hard to legislate this right to work from home, I think the concern now is that it is probably the lower-income workers who have this minimum of seven days of annual leave and who don't have, again, have the luxury of working from home. So I hope MOM can look into this from that perspective as well. By increasing the minimum entitlement, it really would help our lower-income workers. Thank you. SMS cool. So I want to assure member that we will continue to look at how to best support our lower earning workers, uh, including uh, how we can make sure that they have a proper work rest cycle. Mr. Leong Manwai. Mr. Speaker, N Parks has rented out three units uh, for the commercial breeding of cats at the Animal Lodge. NPARCs will continue to monitor the demand for commercial cat breeding and prioritise newly available units for cat breeding where appropriate. Under the Animals and Birds Licensing of Farms rules, a valid licence is required to breed animals for commercial purposes. This is to safeguard animal health and welfare. NPARCs investigates reports of the illegal commercial breeding of animals, including cats, and takes enforcement action against offenders. Cats seized during such investigation will be under the care of NPARCs and its veterinarians. Mr. Leong. Sir, I thank the uh, MOS for the reply. I have three uh, supplementary questions. One, will the AVS allows the breeders to visit the cats even after they are seized by the ABS. Second question, from now on, will the ABS put in a, a more detailed regulatory framework to allow for small breeders to continue their business? And three, is the animal lodge the only place currently available for potential breeders uh, to run their business. I think the animal lodge is uh, in uh, Tengah, is it? Uh, I, 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 that's what I, 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 I've been told. Uh, and that's the only place that uh, the, the breeders are allowed to breed the animals, I heard. Can uh, the MOS uh, confirm that? Thank you. MOS, Pasha. So I thank the member for the excuse. Uh, uh, as the animals are seized as part of the investigation, owners will not be able to visit them while investigation are ongoing. However, the cats will remain under the care of NPARCs and are regularly assessed by NPARCs uh, until investigation are con concluded. The other thing is, uh, the, the other excuse about the regulation framework uh, is something that we continue to look at. Right? Uh, if members have any feedback on it, can, can, can share with me. Uh, an email to us, and uh, currently the Animal Lodge is the only one available. So we are also assessing the demand, right? and uh, we will keep track and then we work with the uh, industry to see how, uh, if there's high demand, right, we, we may uh, look at how we can expand it. So at this moment, we feel that it's adequate. Order.
End of question time. Introduction of government bills. Minister for Communi Communications and Information. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister for Communications and Information, I beg to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Cybersecurity Act 2018. Cyber Security Amendment Bill. Okay. Second reading, what day? At the next available sitting on or after the 7th of May 2024, sir. So be it. Minister for Transport. Mr. Speaker, I beg to introduce a bill in T2, an act to amend the Bus Services Industry Act 2015, the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore Act 2009, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore Act 1996, and the Rapid Transit Systems Act 1995. Transport Sector Critical Bills Bill. Second reading, what day? At the next available sitting. So be it. Order, the clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Resumption of debate on the second reading of the Cooperative Societies Amendment Bill, second reading. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mr. Yip Hong Wing. Mr. Speaker, sir, Singapore's cooperative movement boosts a strong heritage, flourishing since the establishment of the first credit cooperative in the 1920s. Today, about 80 cooperatives serve approximately 1 million members across diverse sectors. NTUC Fairprice, Singapore's largest supermarket retailer and a member-owned cooperative, stands as a prime example. Fairprice continues to play a critical role in keeping Singapore's cost of living in check by ensuring affordable prices for all. The appeal of the cooperative model can be attributed to several factors. First, it emphasizes self-help, mutual assistance, and economic empowerment, principles that resonate with many Singaporeans. Secondly, the government has played a critical role in supporting the cooperative movement. The Cooperative Societies Act provides a legal framework for cooperatives to operate in and the establishment of the Singapore National Cooperative Federation fosters their development. Given the importance of our cooperatives, it is essential that we regularly review the policies and ensure that cooperatives remain relevant in Singapore. I would like to raise several clarifications on the bill. First, Mr. Speaker, sir, I commend the intent behind allowing cooperative societies to pay dividends and honoraria from their reserves subject to the registrar's approval. This approach empowers them to reward members and incentivize good governance. This can potentially lead to better benefits and services for members of organizations like NTUC Fairprice. As such, this is a welcomed amendment. Payouts to members are likely to be more stable. Payouts will also be useful given the rising cost of living. Nevertheless, beyond this, will the government also consider providing more flexibility and options to cooperatives on how they manage their finances? This is important as they face the challenge of relevance amidst competition. For instance, besides a one-size-fits-all approach, will the government consider having a differentiated approach to allow for more flexibility for cooperatives with better fiduciary governance? Also, will the government allow credit cooperatives to advertise their loans to create greater awareness of the services that are available to their members? Next, transparent and accountable implementation is critical. Can the minister clarify on the specific criteria and process the registrar will use for evaluation and approval? Clear guidelines and robust approval processes are essential to prevent misuse or conflicts of interest. Concerns regarding administrating burden exist. The proposed legislative amendments will require the registrar's approval for dividends and honoraria to be, that is paid from reserves. We must ensure that the registry of cooperative societies has sufficient resources to handle the anticipated workload and expedite approvals for all current 80 cooperatives and future ones, preventing unnecessary delays. 
The proposed reduction in signatories for bylaw amendment applications from three to one requires careful consideration. While streamlining processes is valuable, will this weaken the system of checks and balances? Can a single chairperson with ill intentions exploit this change to amend bylaws unilaterally for his own benefit? If so, what are the safeguards to prevent this? To further strengthen the cooperative movement, I propose enhancing reporting and disclosure requirements. Members and stakeholders deserve clear information on reserve allocation and distribution. Robust reporting mechanisms will foster trust and confidence in the cooperative system as a whole. Second, Mr. Speaker, sir, the impact on small and medium-sized societies deserve careful consideration. These organisations may face challenges complying with the new requirements due to limited resources or lack of familiarity with the processes. To ensure inclusive growth within the cooperative movement, I urge the Minister to explore the provision of advisory support and clear guidance to assist these societies in navigating the amendments effectively. Can the Ministry elaborate on the available support measures for them? At a small scale compared to other entities, cooperatives struggle to attract and retain talent. How can the government help more in this area? Also, how can government help smaller cooperatives to digitalise, to keep up with changing consumer demands, as well as deal with challenges associated with digitalisation, such as cyber security? Lastly, Mr. Speaker, sir, I propose amending I propose implementing periodic review and monitoring mechanisms to assess the effectiveness of these changes. As with any new policy, there may be unintended consequences or areas of improvement that emerge over time. By actively seeking feedback and monitoring the practical impact, we can make the necessary adjustments to ensure that the, that the amendments achieve their intended goals. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, sir, the essence of Singapore's cooperative movement built on self-help, mutual assistance and economic empowerment remains as relevant today as it did in its inception. The proposed amendments encapsulate our commitment to nurturing this important sector, empowering cooperatives to adapt and thrive in a rapidly changing landscape. Through transparent governance, support for smaller societies and a commitment to ongoing evaluation, we pave the way for a stronger, more resilient cooperative ecosystem. By embracing these changes, we not only ensure the continued success of stewards like NTUC Fairprice, but also foster an environment where all cooperatives can flourish, contributing meaningfully to our society and economy. I support this bill, recognising the immense potential of cooperatives to shape a more inclusive and prosperous future for Singapore. Thank you. Mr. Neil Perrier. Mr. Speaker, sir, thank you for allowing me to speak on this bill. Cooperative societies play a significant role in Singapore's economic landscape. This has been evident in recent years, especially during the pandemic, when the cooperatives did much to help those displaced at the workplace or struggling with reduced take-home pay. Our cooperative societies also helped cushion price increases and an increased cost of living caused by the volatile global economic and political environment. The Cooperative Societies Amendment Act 2024 is a significant legislative re reform that impacts the broader operations and provides flexibility to the cooperative movement. This act marks a new chapter with enhanced governance for cooperative societies by streamlining regulatory processes, reducing bureaucratic hurdles, and simplifying compliance. By allowing dividends and honoraria to be paid from reserves with the registrar's approval, the Act acknowledges our need for greater operational flexibility. In the current volatile and uncertain economic landscape, it may not be practical for the finances of an organization to be considered purely on a 12-month look. While this remains the case for our corporate entities, there is merit in introducing some form of flexibility accompanied by the appropriate governance controls for cooperatives as they play an essential and unique role in strengthening Singapore's ecosystem. These welcome changes empower leadership and ensure cooperative societies can respond more rapidly to changing member needs and market conditions while maintaining the movement's core democratic principles. 
This amendment represents a pragmatic shift towards a more efficient and responsive cooperative governance. The introduction of the new Section 72A specifying the allocation, distribution, and payment of reserves is particularly noteworthy. This addition allows society to, societies to allocate reserves to various funds subject to the registrar's approval, ensuring flexibility in financial management and maintaining adherence to strong regulatory and member interests. These funds could act as financial buffers, allowing societies to navigate economic uncertainty. Funds for social and environmental efforts can also strengthen the cooperative's reputation and member loyalty. The introduction of Section 72A ensures transparency and accountability in financial decisions and can, can further align the society's financial practices with their long-term sustainability and members' collective welfare. Now I would like to take this opportunity to seek some clarifications on this bill. How will obtaining the registrar's approval for distributing dividends or paying from reserves work in practice? Has the ministry made an assessment on the impact of these amendments on members' rights and benefits? Also, what impact, if any, is expected on member engagement and investment in cooperative societies? Also, with the increased responsibilities and decision-making powers regarding financial distributions from reserves, what additional guidelines or best practices should the Committee of Management follow to ensure transparency and accountability? Lastly, has an assessment been made on how quickly will cooperatives be able to respond to changing economic cycles to help their members under the new approval process? Mr. Speaker, sir. Cooperative societies have historically been bastions of financial stability and community support for the members. By offering a wide range of financial services, including savings and loan options tailored to the members' needs, co-ops play a crucial role in ensuring the financial well-being of individuals within the community. As we look ahead, we must leverage these legislative changes to foster innovation, enhance member engagement, and drive sustainable growth. We must also empower various social institutions, such as co cooperatives, to play a greater role in strengthening our social compact in a relevant and meaningful way. This dual focus on financial and community support is at the heart of the cooperative movement, illustrating the significant role co-ops play in strengthening the social fabric of Singapore. The bill's focus on transparency, accountability, and member-centric governance benefits cooperative society significantly. Mr. Speaker, sir, notwithstanding my clarifications, I stand in support of this bill. Thank you. Mr. Desmond Chu. Mr. Speaker, sir, I support the Cooperatives and Societies Amendment Bill. It offers greater operational and corporate flexibility to cooperatives in Singapore. Now, cooperatives play an important role in promoting mutual assistance and self-help aligning with principles of economic and social benefit to members. The first cooperative was set up close to a century ago. Cooperatives are also important institutions for nation building, such as the Fair Price Group, which seeks to moderate the cost of living for Singaporeans amongst other objectives. They have become an important institution in Singapore, contributing to nation building. They also represent an important ethos of mutual help, and for larger cooperatives, such as the Fair Price Group, they serve important national imperatives. The proposed amendments allowing cooperatives to pay dividends and honoraria from their reserves with the registrar's approval and issue bonds and dependents will facilitate their growth and enhance benefits for their members. While welcoming these changes, I suggest some measures for further consideration by the Ministry. First, there is a diverse range of cooperatives with different levels of resources and governance capabilities. We can consider enabling the well-governed and better-performing cooperatives to take slightly more investment risk or distribute more surpluses to members that will level the playing field and enhance their effectiveness. This is compared to the options offered by other corporate governance structures, which might offer more flexibility in investing accumulated resources. Regarding investment risk, I propose revisiting the default 10% limit on credit co-ops total assets for investing in restricted investments approved by the registrar. 
Increasing this limit, especially for co-ops with robust government structures, will enable them to hedge against inflation and the higher cost of funds and running businesses more effectively. This is especially needed when there are new asset classes and instruments that may require more capital outlay. Second, I hope that the Ministry can explore how co-ops can modernise and access productivity grants available currently to SMEs. Utilising government support for capacity building and technical assistance will enhance governance, management and operational efficiency, optimising resources and activities for membership self-help. Next, on the Central Cooperative Fund or CCF Fund or CCF grants. The CCF grants serve as an important tool in promoting the progress of co-ops. For example, the recently unveiled sustainability grant provides funding support to enable co-ops to kickstart the sustainability journey in line with Singapore's Green Plan 2030. Can the Ministry share on the uptake of the sustainability grant to date? The Progressive Workplace Grant, which provided a one-off grant for adopting the tripartite standards in 2023, has been given out to 25 cooperatives. This translates into 25 more cooperatives with more progressive workplace standards. In considering the changing needs of the workforce, progressive workplace standards must now be the norm, as opposed to the exception. This is especially so whereby co-ops are established for the purpose of doing good for members. Can the Ministry considering extending or enhancing the Progressive Workplace Grant to encourage greater adoption of tripartite standards. Promoting Progressive Workplace Standards aligns with the ethos of co-ops aiming to benefit their members. In conclusion, co-ops play a crucial role in promoting the public good and these amendments will empower them to better serve their members and the community and ultimately Singapore. Mr Speaker, I support the bill. Mr Joshua Raj Thomas. So I rise in support of the bill. Cooperative societies or co-ops are an interesting commercial vehicle. The principles of co-ops referred to in the Act have been elaborated by MCCY to include, amongst other things, democratic control, as well as members' economic participation and compensation. In this regard, co-ops allow a large number of people to participate in commercial activities. Indeed, the widespread involvement in co-ops is indicated by the fact that although there are only 80 co-ops, they have between them over 1 million members. Sir, the proposed amendments will, amend, will enable co-ops to have more flexibility in the use of their reserves. Importantly, committee of management members can now also receive honoraria as well as allowances. I think this is fair. While sitting on the COM may be a form of service to members, co-ops are, after all, economic-driven vehicles and COM members should be compensated fairly for the contributions to their co-op. In order for co-ops to avail of the new provisions under the Act, they must first seek approval from the Registrar and then the annual general meeting of their members. The AGMs and members' involvement uh, and scrutiny, therefore, becomes more critical. These members will range from those who are more savvy about their rights and some that may not be so. Some of the provisions in the Act can be quite technical. The present amendments also expand the scope of matters that may be brought to the AGM. In this regard, I would like to ask the Minister what efforts MCCY makes and will be making to educate co-op members of their rights under the Act, what they will be doing uh, to educate COM members on their duties, including efforts taken in cooperation with the Singapore National Cooperative Federation. Sir, notwithstanding my clarifications, I support the bill. Mr. Don Wee. Mr. Speaker, sir. I rise in support of the proposed amendments to the Cooperative Society, Societies Act, which aim to enable cooperative societies to better utilise their reserves, provide legal clarity and make the necessary technical updates. The proposed amendments seek to address several key areas, including the broadening of the use of reserves by co-ops. Currently, co-ops face limitations in declaring dividends solely for the preceding year's surplus, which may not always align with their members' needs, especially in volatile environments. I have no objection to the amendments which would permit co-ops to use their reserves to distribute dividends to members or pay honorarium to members of the Committee of Management, subject to the approval of the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. While these amendments represent progress towards enhancing the regulatory framework for co-ops, there are certain aspects that warrant further scrutiny and deliberation. As we navigate through the clauses of the bill, I would like to pose the following questions for consideration. 
Clause 2 defines the term reserves and makes consequential amendments to the definitions of dividend and honorarium. Would the Minister elaborate on the criteria and considerations for the Registrar's approval of the distribution of dividends or payments of honorarium from reserves? Clause 5 reduces the number of signatories required for the registration of amendments to bylaws from three to one person. What measures will be in place to ensure accountability and transparency in the decision-making process regarding such amendments? Mr. Speaker, sir, in Mandarin. Uh, clause 8 specified that any distribution of dividends or payment of honoraria from reserves must be approved by the members of the society in the annual general meeting. How will the registrar ensure that members are adequately informed and empowered to make informed decisions during these meeting, meetings? Clause 11 removes the requirements for the registrar's approval for the issuance of bonds or a debenture of a co by co-ops. What safeguards will be put in place to prevent misuse or mismanagement of funds raised through such instruments? Co-ops are different from other business entities in that they are based on members working towards common economic and social objectives. Hence, it is imperative that legislative changes enhance transparency, accountability and good governance. I look forward to the Ministry's response and clarifications on how the amendments will serve the best interests of our cooperative societies and their members. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mount Lee. Mr. Speaker, sir, cooperative societies play an important role in fostering community-driven economic development by empowering individuals to collectively address mutual needs and achieve social progress. Today, there are 79 co-ops in Singapore comprising consumer and service co-ops that provide goods and services to their members and credit co-ops that provide financial services such as taking in deposits and granting loans to members. The current proposed amendment seeks to allow co-ops to hold their to use their reserves to pay dividends to members or pay honorarium to the committee of management. This is subject to the registrar's approval as a prudential safeguard, as it means that co-ops may declare dividends even if no surplus is achieved in the preceding year. This provision appears to deviate from the strict corporate practice of paying out dividends only from retained profits prompting concern, especially for credit co-ops that are subject to prudential ratios. Currently, credit co-ops that do not meet the minimum capital adequacy ratio, or CAR, of 10% are bound by strict loan limits on unsecured general loans and must seek the registrar's written approval to distribute dividends from that year's surplus. The intent behind these rules is to ensure that credit co-ops build up sufficient institutional capital to absorb operational losses. By allowing the use of reserves to pay out dividends may put credit co-ops at risk of reducing institutional capital and potentially CAR impairment, given the increasing volatil volatility of our operational and financial environment. I would like to confirm if there are other advisory and fiduciary safeguards in place, in addition to the registrar's approval to help credit co-ops to better assess dividend-related decisions in a prudent and objective manner. With the broadening of the use of reserves, consistent policies, procedures and processes are even more critical to good governance in co-ops. The Registry of Cooperative Societies, RCS, and Singapore National Cooperative Federation, SNCF, have done a good job in producing various governance guides in internal controls, loan management and investment management, and training to co-op sector in the use of these joint reserves. Looking ahead, I propose two recommendations for the RCS and SNCF. First, to investigate the feasibility of creating a shared secretariat service, modelled after the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce, to assist smaller trade associations with limited resources. This would help in administrative and operational tasks, aiding their members more effectively. 
Second, to develop a shared service offering that could address collective concerns of cooperatives, such as cybersecurity threats and adoption of new technologies like AI, thereby enhancing overall efficiency and growth. Some of this work can be done through a centralized pool of technology providers or audit firms that can build up their understanding of and customization of solutions and services for the co-op sector over time. This will enable co-ops to better manage costs to minimize the need for them to dip into their reserves on a sustained basis. Finally, co-ops are lean outfits that often struggle to attract and retain talent. In addition to ongoing efforts to build capabilities through the sector competency framework and youth outreach and engagement, the co-op sector can consider putting in place a formal secondment program for mutual expose, exposure opportunities between co-ops and public and private sector organizations. For high potential co-op officers, this will enable them with policy and or commercial exposure and enable them to enhance their skill sets to foster innovation within co-ops. In conclusion, the proposed amendments to the Cooperative Societies Act are designed to empower co-ops to serve their members' interests more effectively. However, these changes must be implemented alongside robust safeguards to ensure prudent risk management. It is also imperative that co-ops persist in seeking efficiencies and enhancing their effectiveness to maintain sustainability over the long term. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Notwithstanding my questions and recommendations presented, I express my support for the bill. Mr. Speaker, sir, before I answer uh -huh. members' questions, I would like to take the opportunity to thank, recognise and also acknowledge the contributions that you, Mr. Speaker, sir, have made to the cooperative sectors over many decades, including as chair of the SNCF. I think the members have very robustly and um, thoughtfully uh, and acknowledged the contributions of the co-op sector to Singapore's social uh, development. And so thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, for your years of developing the co-op sector. Uh, turning now to the specificities of the bill, I would also like to thank members, Mr. Mark Lee, Mr. Neil Parekh, Mr. Don Wee, Mr. Yip Hon Wing, Mr. Desmond Chu, and Mr. Raj Joshua Thomas for speaking on the bill. There are also many other members who have come up to me and also expressed their views about the bill, um, including Mr. Liang Eng Hua for his parliamentary questions about the role of co-ops in strengthening this social compact that I mentioned earlier on. First, let me address the need for the safeguards for use of reserves. Mr. Mark Lee commented that allowing co-ops to pay dividends from their reserves contrasts with the corporate practice of paying out dividends only from retained profits. You made the comparison. Uh, Mr. Mark Lee also noted that this may be of concern for credit co-ops, particularly given that the drawdown of reserves would reduce their institutional capital and therefore their CAR or capital adequacy ratio. Uh, Mr. Mark Lee also asked about the safeguards to help credit co-ops make prudent decisions as they pay dividends from their reserves. Currently, a co-op may only pay dividends from the preceding year's surplus, and we propose to allow them to tap their reserves to pay dividends and honoraria subject to the registrar's approval. This will allow co-ops to tap only on their general unallocated reserves, such as the accumulated surplus, and reserves allocated specifically to the payment of dividends of honoraria, as the case may be. This will be made clear to co-ops through issued guidelines. I also agree with Mr Lee that credit co-ops must maintain adequate capital buffers and ensure adequate safeguards to protect members' interests. There are two layers of safeguards over using reserves to pay dividends or honoraria. First, co-ops must seek registrar's approval and the registrar will also consider um, factors like reasonableness of proposed rates compared to previous years, past compliance track records of the co-ops, the co-ops strength of governance, and particularly for credit co-ops, if these credit co-ops have met prudential requirements. Credit co-ops must also demonstrate that they can meet the prevailing minimum CAR after their proposed dividend or honoraria payment. And second, of course, co-ops must obtain members' approval. Moving on to the second category of questions on the process for registrar's approval. 
Mr. Neil Parrick, Mr. Don Wee, Mr. Yip Hon Wing asked about regarding uh, questions about regarding the obtaining of registrar's approval for payment from reserves and the impact that this approval may have. Well, the registrar will issue guidelines to co-ops on the information and documents that co-ops need to submit or provide to the registrar. These will set clear expectations for co-ops on the prerequisites for the application and allow the registry to focus on co-ops which satisfy these prerequisites. And upon receiving the registrar's approval, the co-op must seek members' approval with a specific resolution at their annual general meeting or AGM. This will ensure adequate disclosure on the proposed use of the reserves. Members will also be able to refer to the co-op's audited financial statements, which will also be tabled for members' approval. This enables members to understand the financial impact of such payments on the reserves, if any, before making an informed decision. Co-ops must hold their AGM within six months from the financial year end, so there's enough time for them to obtain registrar's approval before conducting the AGM. Mr. Yip Hon Wing also proposed a review and monitoring mechanism to ensure that this and other legislative changes are meeting the intended objectives. We will monitor the implementation of these new proposed changes and will refine the administrative processes over time, if and where necessary. And this is to facilitate co-op's operations and to ensure that there are adequate safeguards in place. The third category refers to members' questions on the review of the dividend cap. Under the current legislative framework, a co-op must not pay a dividend on paid-up share capital or subscription capital exceeding 10% per annum. Mr Chu asked if MCCY can allow better governed co-ops to distribute more to their members. Mr Ip asked also if we can apply a differentiated approach to allow for more flexibility for co-ops with better fiduciary governance. I thought it's important for me to make two points to these suggestions. First, as members uh, already know, co-ops are uniquely different from other corporate corporates due to their membership-based structure and their social mission. Co-ops reserves are built up slowly over the years through collective efforts by past and present co-op officers and members. These reserves are therefore very critical for them to meet any losses or operational needs due to unforeseen events. Co-ops must therefore be very prudent when using their reserves. The current 10% dividend seeks to help co-ops to prioritise their long-term financial health and sustainability while fulfilling their social mission and objectives and also their members' specific needs. While some may compare dividend payments to that of other corporates, the dividend yield for most larger public listed companies typically do not exceed 10%. So the dividend cap for co-ops also reflect a balance between providing decent returns to their members and then also retaining funds for co-ops, operations and growth. As such, we feel that the current cap will be generally adequate for co-ops. Second, we recognise the broad diversity of our co-op sectors. Some are large-scale and professionally run, while others are smaller and mainly volunteer-run. Naturally, governments' capabilities and the size of reserves across this whole spectrum vary. MCCY will study this further to assess how to meet the needs of different types of co-ops across this spectrum, while ensuring adequate safeguards to protect members' interests as well as the co-ops long-term financial health and sustainability. The fourth category of questions relate to amendments to facilitate co-ops operations. I will address queries on the safeguards for the two amendments named, uh, uh, aimed to facilitate these operations. Mr Don Wee and Mr Yip Hong Wing asked how the proposed reduction of signatories required for an application to register bylaw amendments would impact accountability and also to prevent abuse. Sir, the legislation will continue to require amendments to bylaws to first be approved by members at a general meeting or a referendum. In the case of a general meeting, the resolution to make amendments must be passed by at least three quarters of the members present and voting. The co-op must thereafter submit an extract of the resolution of the general meeting to the registrar together with the application form. This will help ensure that the co-op had followed due process in calling for the general meeting and that members have duly approved the amendments. Most co-ops would already have sought or would rather would also have sought registry's comments on the proposed bylaw amendments prior to tabling them at the general meeting. 
we will continue with this general practice. Mr. Donby also touched on removing the requirement for registrar's approval for the issuance of bonds and debentures by co-ops. He asked what safeguards will be in place to prevent misuse or mismanagement of funds raised through such instruments. So I'd like to assure Mr. Donwee that MCCY is mindful that co-ops need more flexibility in their operations. That since co-ops are already subjected to relevant laws on issuance of bonds and debentures, there is no need for an additional layer of registrar's approval. <coughs> Excuse me. When making such issuances, the co-op's management must explain to potential investors the structure of the bonds and debentures and how these proceeds will be used. As a membership-based organisation, the co-op's COM will, is ultimately accountable to its members for the management of the co-op's funds. Should any co-op be found to have mismanaged the funds, the registrar will take action under the Act. Fifth, members asked questions about support for and development of the sector. And to this end, I really thank members for recognising the important role that co-ops play in our society, as well as the support that both MCCY and NCF provides in the development of our co-op sector. Mr Desmond Chu suggested studying how to help co-ops to modernise and use the productivity grants that are available to SMEs. As I mentioned, co-ops can access grants from the CCF, and MCCY also works closely with SNCF to ensure that the grants remained relevant. Over the last five years, CCF dispersed about $2.7 million worth of grants to co-ops. In addition to grants to assist eligible new co-ops with startup costs, co-ops can also apply for development grants, training grants, basic support grants, and special grants that address emerging risks and needs. <coughs> MCCY has also supported conferences and events organised by SNCF to raise awareness of topics such as data protection, sustainability and cybersecurity. So Mr Mark Lee suggested exploring the feasibility of a shared secretariat service to assist co-ops with limited resources. He also suggested a shared service that could address concerns such as cybersecurity threats and the adoption of new technologies. Mr Yip Hong-Wing also asked if government could help smaller co-ops digitalise. Members will know that it's challenging to standardise the scope of works for shared services given the diversity of co-ops and the diverse needs of co-ops across the co-op sector and that spectrum. So our general approach is to provide support through the CCF Development Grant, which gives co-ops the flexibility to engage suitable service providers to meet their own unique operational needs and to tailor these um, programs to their specific requirements. <coughs> Nevertheless, I think it's a very good suggestion and so we are open to exploring with SNCF and the sector on centralised services where it's appropriate and where co-ops find that useful. We also work with SNCF to raise the awareness of emerging issues such as cyber security as well as to offer the, a CCF cyber security grant which co-funds a recommended subscription-based solution to manage cybersecurity risks that Mr Lee as well as Mr Yip Hon Wing mentioned earlier. Mr Lee and Mr Yip also highlighted co-op's struggle to attract and retain talent. Mr Yip asked how government could help in this area and Mr Lee suggested a secondment program between co-ops and the public and private sector organisations. We will explore Mr Lee's idea further with SNCF and the co-ops. Mr Lee also mentioned outgoing initiatives to build the capabilities of co-ops, com and staff. These include customised causes unique for the sector. MCCY, for example, is working with SNCF to introduce a new customised audit committee course for credit co-ops in May 2024, this year. This audit committee course aims to enhance audit committee members' understanding of their roles and responsibilities and to sharpen their knowledge of relevant topics like risk management, internal controls, audit and financial reporting. SNCF has also established the Emerging Leaders Programme in 2022, which aims to groom 100 leaders in five years. SNCF also organises conferences, networking events, sharing sessions to expose co-op officers um, to best practices and practical solutions that uh, are adopted by their peers. On members' rights, which Mr Raj Joshua Thomas um, raised, relating to efforts to educate co-op members on their rights under the Act. 
I'd like to uh, respond that it, as member-owned organisations, co-ops are governed by their own bylaws as well as requirements under the Act. But we aim to foster an environment of both accountability and transparency by ensuring that co-ops make sufficient disclosures to members. Now, one of our pro proposed amendments is a case in point. While co-ops must already obtain members' approval for payment of allowance, honoraria and other benefits to the, co to, to the COM, we proposed amending the Act to make this an explicit function of the AGM. This will help ensure that members' approval is obtained for such benefits. In 2019, the Registrar also notified co-ops about the minimum information they need to disclose in an annual report to inform members about activities of the co-op and to make informed decisions. These include, for example, adequate disclosure on its activities and financial performance. Co-ops are also encouraged to disclose more information as they deem fit. Mr Desmond Chu also asked about the sustainability grant. Uh, I seek his indulgence because we just set up the grant uh, in 1st of January 2024, so we'll provide more stats as we, the, the take-up rate is steady. <coughs> Next, I'll move on to <coughs> um, Mr Yip's questions about whether the government would allow credit co-ops to advertise their loans to create greater awareness of their services. Credit co-ops are generally set up to serve their members who share a pre-existing common bond, such as the same industry, the same organisation or the same community. Credit risks are mitigated as many credit co-ops have arrangements with their members, employers for salary deductions for loan repayments to co-ops. As a membership-based organisation, credit co-ops are not regulated to the same degree as other financial institutions, hence they are not open to the general public and should not advertise in mass media. Nonetheless, credit co-ops are not precluded from advertising directly to their members. In the course of the registry's engagement with the co-ops and public consultation for the current bill, we receive feedback to review and advertising restrictions for credit co-ops. So we are studying this matter further. Mr. Speaker, sir, I would like to conclude by addressing Mr. Liang's related PQ on co-ops. Mr. Liang asked if Singapore needs new co-ops to meet evolving social economic landscape and if the roles and social missions of co-ops can be strengthened under Forward Singapore. In view of our refreshed social compact and renewed sense of social solidarity, co-ops indeed offer an additional platform for Singaporeans to come together and to address the society's evolving needs. So to remain relevant and increase co-ops' impact, they must continue to build their capabilities and their competencies, the point that members have been raising in this debate. This would strengthen confidence in and enhance recruitment into the sector. Co-op leaders themselves should also ensure that they can lead their co-ops in a rapidly evolving environment. They should adopt a growth mindset, participate in professional development and continuous learning courses, and put in place succession planning to ensure their co-ops longevity longevity and continued relevance. MCCY will continue to work with our partners, the CCF committee and SNCF to support co-ops and cooperators along their journey. Mr Speaker, sir, I beg to move. Do members have clarifications for MOS turn? Mr Yong? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have a clarification for MOS. According to the 2023 annual report published by the Registry of Cooperative Societies, co-ops in Singapore currently hold a staggering $19.4 billion worth in total assets. However, as we all know, the cooperatives vary in sizes and correspondingly also vary in standards of governance. So in 2018, I had proposed to the Ministry to consider implementing an annual ranking or annual grading system for credit cooperatives. Such a system would promote better, government, better governance and better accountability. With the proposed changes in this bill, I would like to ask if the Ministry would implement an annual ranking or grading system to be applied to all co-ops. Through such a system, we can recognise co-ops that are better governed while maintaining the necessary checks on co-ops with weaker financial positions. So I, th 
So I thank Mr. Melvin Yong for his uh, supplementary question and, and also his contributions to the co-op sector. Uh, I've addressed Mr. Yong's first query regarding the Rule 13, which is the review of the 10% uh, cap uh, just earlier on. And just to reiterate, the 10% cap I think we think is generally sufficient for co-ops as it reflects a balance in providing returns to decent returns to members and also safeguarding uh, reserves for co-ops operations and growth. On Mr. Yong's suggestion for an annual ranking to identify co-ops that are better governed, as well as those that are weaker and which require more checks, I mean, earlier I mentioned that uh, there's a spectrum of different strengths, sizes and capabilities and governance uh, for co-ops. Um, there is currently no public ranking of co-ops, uh, given that co-ops are membership-based organisations and this, these members are also privy to the co-ops financial positions and other members which are surfaced or uh, in, in the audited financial statements which I mentioned earlier on. They are also surfaced in annual reports as well as their general meetings. But when in doubt, members can and should also reach out to the co-ops committee of management, the COM, to seek clarification. The Registry of Cooperative Societies, RCS, does in fact do, does have monitoring mechanisms in place to monitor co-ops and adopts a differentiated regulatory approach for co-ops. I'll give you an example. Uh, the registry conducts periodic special audits on credit co-ops and reviews the co-ops financial statements and annual reports to assess their financial health and their, finan and their governance. For those, if the RCS identifies weaker co-ops, for example, the registry will engage these co-ops to provide assistance to improve their financial health and governance. Um, I mentioned earlier on last yesterday and today as well that governance as well as improving the, uh, the ability and, uh, uh, of, of the co-ops to manage these are critically important. So I'd like to assure Mr Melvin Yong that the registry, SNCF and others and MCCY will continue to raise governance standards of co-ops. Thank you. Ms Tan. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I would like to uh, thank uh, MOS Tan and uh, express I'm especially encouraged by the Emerging Leaders Program uh, that is jointly organised by SNCF. I would like to ask, given that uh, the co-op uh, community actually holds uh, so much assets and that it can play a pretty transformative role in terms of helping Singapore to cater to some of the more complex social needs, um, does MCCY have any plans uh, to provide opportunities, for example, under the Emerging Leaders Program for youths uh, and young people interested in the social enterprise and co-op uh, uh, operations to gain experience and learning from other regional economies who may have a more matured uh, development or who are at a more advanced stage of their development in their uh, social economy, including cooperatives and the way that they have uh, advanced and developed in their own countries. Thank you. MOS Tan. So I thank Ms. Kerry Tan for her SQ. The uh, short answer is yes. I mean, in addition to the Emerging Leaders Program, uh, there are many uh, young uh, youths who are involved with our cooperative sector. I've met many of them through my interactions with SNCF and through the many cooperatives get together. Um, in addition to the Emerging Leaders Program, there are many other uh, programs that uh, co-ops can use uh, through the grants that uh, are provided to them to increase leadership, to increase governance standards, to increase fi uh, um, capabilities about things like audit, uh, finance and also to help look at emerging areas such as cybersecurity, sustainability and the likes. And in fact, when I speak to youths in the cooperative sector, they are, uh, one of the main key uh, attractiveness of the cooperative sector is for, uh, to allow them to explore some of these emerging um, uh, issues as well as emerging opportunities. So the short answer is yes, there is interaction between the youths within this cooperative sector in Singapore and then also we explore, um, if we don't already have, um, to explore learning from others uh, outside of Singapore as well. Any other clarifications for MOS Tan? I don't see any. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as, are, as there are of the opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Cooperative Societies Amendment Bill. Committee stage what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. The question is that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. 
as many as, are, as they are of the opinion say aye. aye. <coughs> to the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 1 to 15 stand part of the bill. As many as are, there are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. Think the ayes have it? The ayes have it. Bill to be reported. Minister for Culture, Community and Youth. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to report that the bill has been considered in committee and agreed to without amendment. Third reading, what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that the bill be now read a third time. Question is that the bill be now read a third time. As, as many as are, there are of the opinion say aye. To the contrary, say no. Think the ayes have it? The ayes have it. Cooperative Societies Amendment Bill. Item 2, Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Amendment Bill, second reading. Minister for Home Affairs. On, on behalf of the Minister for Home Affairs, I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. Sir, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act 1955 was last extended in 2018 for five years till 20 October 2024. The Act is a critical piece of legislation for us to deal with egregious criminal activities which threaten the sense of safety and security in Singapore, in particular the activities of gangs and secret societies. This bill seeks to extend the Act for another five years. Secret societies have been in Singapore for a long time. In the 1950s, gang activity in Singapore was rampant. Secret societies were involved in illicit activities and used violence to impose fear on the community. Victims and witnesses feared reprisal against themselves and their family members if they testified against the secret societies. This made prosecution in court extremely difficult. It was against this backdrop that the Act was introduced. The Act gave the government levers to deal effectively with the problem. Under the Act, the Minister for Home Affairs may detain or place under police supervision persons associated with activities of a criminal nature. These activities are set out in the fourth schedule of the Act and include involvement in a secret society or as a gangster. These powers are exercised carefully and sparingly. The minister must be satisfied that detaining a person under the Act is necessary in the interest of public safety, peace and good order. The power to detain someone under the Act is used only when prosecution is not viable, for example, because victims and witnesses refuse to testify for fear of reprisal. We have put in place safeguards in the exercise of these powers. First, the consent of the public prosecutor must be obtained for detention order or supervision order. He must be satisfied that prosecution is not viable before allowing executive action under the Act. Second, we have three committees that are independent of MHA to ensure that detentions are necessary in the interest of public safety, peace and good order. The first committee scrutinizes every detention and supervision order issued by the minister. It is chaired by a sitting judge of the Supreme Court and comprises senior and experienced lawyers. It examines the evidence that was considered by the minister in issuing the order and submits its report to the president to recommend the confirmation, variation or cancellation of the order. A second committee considers every confirmed detention order at least once annually. 
It will consider whether the detainee continues to pose a threat to public safety, peace and good order, and whether the detainee should continue to be detained or released. A third committee reviews detention cases which are being considered for extension beyond 10 years to determine if continued detention is indeed necessary. The Act requires the committees to have regard to public safety, the protection of individuals and the safeguarding of sources of information in their deliberation. They are required to submit a report to the President who may, on the advice of the Cabinet, confirm, vary or cancel the order made by the Minister. Third, detainees are required to attend in person before the First Committee when the Committee considers the order made by the Minister. Detainees can be represented by lawyers and may make representations to the various committees. Fourth, every decision made under the Act can be subject to judicial review. This was made clear by the Minister for Home Affairs when the Act was amended in 2018. So I want to emphasise this point, as I know that some members have raised their concerns as to whether the Act outs judicial review. It does not. Over the years, the number of detention and supervision orders issued under the Act has declined from 21st October 2019 to 31st December 2023, 123 persons were dealt with under the Act. 86 detention orders, DOs, and 37 police supervision orders, PSOs, were issued. This was fewer than the number of cases in the same period of the previous term of the Act. Even so, the number of orders issued is significant and the Act continues to be necessary and relevant, not only against secret societies, but also other criminal activities such as unlicensed money lending. Gangs and organised crime groups continue to be a big threat to societies globally. These groups are involved in a wide spectrum of criminal conduct, including illegal drugs, scams, money laundering, human trafficking, firearms, and vehicle-related crimes. In the US, gangs and gang-related criminal activities remain prevalent. Gangs there actively recruit new members, have carved out drug distribution territories, and collaborate with other criminal groups for power and financial gains. They are well organized and have significant reach and influence even across the US borders. In August 2023, the United Nations reported that hundreds of thousands of people are being trafficked by criminal gangs and coerced into working in scam centers and other illegal operations across Southeast Asia. Billions of dollars are made annually by such gangs who force the victims into crimes and subject them to threats, torture, and even sexual violence. This is happening at our doorstep. There is a strong nexus between gang membership and violent crimes. Studies have found that gangs reinforce violent behaviour by routinely exposing gang members to high-risk situations and rewarding them for their violence. Moreover, gang members often see violence as a way to earn respect, status and reputation. Because of the way gangs operate, witness intimidation in gang trials is a serious concern for many jurisdictions and an obstacle to justice. The true extent of this is impossible to measure because witness intimidation is often not reported. Gangs have also used technology and social networking sites such as X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to intimidate witnesses. In a recent incident in Virginia, USA, a member of a street gang intimidated witnesses by posting their names on Instagram and calling for gang members to gather in the courtroom to, I quote, watch the snitches snitching, unquote. As a result, some witnesses pull out of testifying and the trial had to be postponed. When criminals such as gangs and secret societies 
cannot be brought to justice for their crimes, then the criminal justice system has failed. Instead of the people feeling protected, a climate of fear envelops the society. The people lose confidence in the criminal justice system and ultimately the state. As I explained earlier, the act is used where prosecution is not viable because witnesses are unwilling to testify in court for fear of reprisal. Witness intimidation is a problem in Singapore too. Some countries have witnessed relocation and protection programs. However, because Singapore is so small, witness relocation would not be feasible or effective. Even in big countries, these measures are not always foolproof. Moreover, witness protection programs take a very heavy toll on the protected witnesses. They have to change their identity, change their job, and cut off contact with families and friends. We should ask ourselves, why should witnesses and victims have to bear heavy personal costs in bringing society, secret society members to justice? In Singapore, there are still active secret societies, although not in the numbers and scale in some other countries. Nevertheless, they are still a menace to law and order, public safety and security. They recruit young Singaporeans and engage in illicit activities and violent conduct. That is why we must continue to clamp down on them. I will give you a few recent examples of when we had to use the powers under the Act. One incident took place on 9th November 2021 at about 4 a.m. Ten gang members gathered at a rival gang member's flat. They were armed with deadly weapons, including machete, a knuckle duster, and a carambit knife. They were there to seek revenge as they believed that a rival gang member had assaulted their hitmen. When they found out that the rival gang member was not at home, they attacked his family members instead. They punched and kicked the person's parents, brother, and sister. The father suffered a facial bone fracture, while the mother sustained a forearm fracture. Seven of the gang members were dealt with under the act. Another incident took place on 8 January 2022 at about 10.30 p.m. There was a gang flag, uh, clash between rival secret societies at Circular Road. During the riot, gang members of one of the secret societies chased and assaulted the rival gang members. The rival gang members were kicked and punched in full view of the public. One gang member used a knife to stab a rival, to stab a rival gang member's leg. Four of the gang members were dealt with under the act. In addition to gang-related incidents, the act is also used against organized crimes, such as unlicensed money lending. In 2019, we used the act to detain a number of leaders and financiers of an unlicensed money lending syndicate, which was linked to more than 1,800 cases of harassment of debtors in Singapore. Without the act, we would not have been able to do much against them. The victims and witnesses feared reprisal and were not willing to testify. The perpetrators would have been able to carry on with their violence and intimidation with impunity. So, sir, to conclude, we continue to have to use the Act. We cannot be complacent about the safety and security that Singaporeans enjoy today and that we do not live in fear of gangs and secret societies and are not intimidated by them, unlike in many other countries. The Act is an essential tool for the government to ensure this. Sir, I beg to move. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mr. Murali Pillay. Mr. Speaker, sir, 
I wish to declare that I'm a lawyer in private practice who has dealt with detention cases under the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act 1955, which I'll call the Act. This bill represents the 15th time that Parliament is being asked to extend the Act. Given the longevity of this Act, which was enacted almost 70 years ago, the sceptical amongst us may be tempted to say there is nothing temporary about this Act. I would respectfully suggest, however, that that would be a case of missing the wood for the trees. This Act rests with the Minister for Home Affairs with extraordinary powers to order the detention without trial of a person accused of having association with specified activities of a criminal nature, DO, or subjecting him to a supervising or supervision order, SO. These powers are meant to be used as a matter of last resort because of the difficulty in securing evidence against such persons as explained by the Honourable Minister of State, primarily by reason of their association with secret societies. By design, these powers constitute a derogation from the usual due process accorded to persons accused of crime, which will involve the court independently adjudicating on the case after reviewing the evidence. The exception has been justified on the basis of the pernicious nature of secret society operations and the need to preserve public order in Singapore. As was mentioned by the Honourable Minister of State, several safeguards have been worked into the framework as well. So I won't traverse the same ground, save to add that the advisory committees that the Honourable Minister of State mentioned are headed by sitting judges of the Supreme Court, so all of them occupying a high constitutional office. Notwithstanding the safeguards, given the exceptional nature of the power, However, it is apt that there is a further mechanism built into the Act to allow Parliament to satisfy itself of the continued need to confer on the Minister these powers before deciding to extend the Act. Hence, the reference to temporary in the Act is really a recognition of the fact that these are extraordinary powers requiring the Minister to periodically make a case in Parliament on the reasons for extending the Act to enable him to use the powers. This constitutes responsible politics. I now turn to the Honourable Minister's case, Honourable Minister of State's case for extending the Act. Uh, as was mentioned by the Honourable Minister of State, the numbers of detention have come down. Now I looked at it, in 2019 it was 97 detention orders issued, 2022, 80 detention orders. For context, these detention numbers were much higher in the in the 80s and up to the early 90s, they were in the four digits. And they were in the three digits up to the first decade of the new millennium. So this is therefore good news, that the numbers have reduced appreciably over the last four decades. The bad news, however, as I note from the Honourable Minister of State's uh, speech, that there continues to be a, serious number, a number of serious secret society clashes that affect the peace and good order of Singapore. Uh, what is noteworthy in these cases, as was mentioned by the Honourable Minister of State, was that the prosecution was not viable because win witnesses refused to give evidence in court for fear of reprisal. Such violent acts, should they go unpunished, would threaten the peace and security that we are accustomed to, and some even take for granted. This we cannot afford. In addition, the Honourable Minister of State refers to a significant number of organised criminal activities, such as unlicensed money lending and drug trafficking by secret societies, again, where witnesses are unwilling to come forward to testify against them in court. Without decisive action taken under this Act to cripple the syndicates, many more Singaporeans may have fallen victim. So hence, this Act has an effect of preventing the proliferation of such crime. Apart from what the Honourable Minister of State highlighted in this, court, in this House, I note with concern that it is stated in the Global Organised Crime Index report on Singapore for 2023 that foreign criminal actors continue to operate in Singapore with, and I quote, moderate influence. And almost all of them are involved in immigration-related crimes, money laundering and scams, amongst others. I would imagine them to be fairly sophisticated in their criminal activities and be likely not be easy to get witnesses to spill the beans on them. This brings to my mind what the then Minister for Home Affairs, Mr Wong Kan Seng, said in this House in 1994 about the threat of organised crime, particularly Asian triads and gangs, 
which continues to be real across much of the world today. Mr Wong stated that the act served as a deterrence against these overseas triads and gangs from shifting operations into Singapore to deal with these hardened criminals with sophisticated international networks, we need laws with teeth and muscle. This act has that pre prerequisites. On balance, I'm convinced, based on the hard facts that was laid out in this house by the Honourable Minister of State, that it's, it is better, it's in the better interest of Singapore that the act be extended. I therefore support the bill. Sir, I would, however, like to make a case for the police to do more to prevent youths from being recruited by secret societies. Through my pro bono criminal practice, as well as a two-year involvement in a study of youths at risk for a self-help group, I have noted the tendency of, for secret societies to recruit youths from a relatively young age. Young people are the oxygen or lifeblood of secret societies. Once recruited, the youths become the secret society's fighters who protect and advance their criminal objectives. As I will be alluded, alluding to shortly, if we can starve the secret societies of this oxygen, we will be able to significantly curb the society's influence and activities. In the study that I was involved in, it was noted that the entry age for secret society members ranged from as young as 11 to 18. Once these youths join the secret societies, a number of them will be introduced to alcohol and controlled drugs. They, in turn, develop violent streaks, which the headmen would then use to unleash against rival gangs. In answer to a parliamentary question I filed in October 2020, the Honourable Minister for Home Affairs revealed that the median age of persons subject to detention orders and police supervision orders between 2017 and 2019 was only 22. He also stated that the youngest person subject to these orders was 17. In fact, I was personally involved in a pro bono case where a 17-year-old boy was issued with a detention order, which was subsequently extended as well. On the face of it, I would imagine that for some of us, this may be seen as a case of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. However, the reality is that depending on the facts of the case, young people as part of a gang can cause serious harm, even death. They pose a danger to themselves too, as violence begets violence. Depending on the facts, it may be necessary to invoke the act to issue either a DO or PO to preserve public safety, peace and good order in Singapore, something we cannot take for granted. I'm aware that the police does good work to help youth to keep away from the clutches of secret societies. The Honourable Minister, in his answer to my PQ in 2020, highlighted some of these steps. He said that the police works with the Ministry of Social and Family Development, Ministry of Education and Singapore Prison Service to develop and implement preventive and rehabilitative initiatives. These initiatives include the streetwise and enhanced streetwise programs aimed at providing youths associated with secret societies with counselling. The secret Sorry, the Secret Society branch of the CID also regularly runs Camp ACE, which means all can escape, to educate youths on the perils of joining a secret society and educational talks for parents on telltale signs. However, the secret societies are not keeping still. Through my work in the study, I learned that secret societies have evolved methods to specifically target and recruit youths in communities and school settings as well. These societies may well double their efforts in an environment where generally enrollment in secret societies is falling. The activities usually start off as being rather innocuous as social gatherings, but lead to initiation ceremonies after which the youths will start being at the back and call of their respective hitmen. I see such recruitment activities as capacity building to undertake activities of a criminal nature that are contemplated under the Act. Such acts should equally be viewed as affecting the peace and good order of Singapore too. I'm aware that recruiting persons to join unlawful societies constitutes an offence under the Societies Act 1966, where the police has secured evidence of recruitment activities, such persons should be prosecuted. In cases where evidence on record is not forthcoming, perhaps because of intimidation, I wonder if the powers under the Act can also be invoked against these recruiters. 
In paragraph three of the fourth schedule to the act, which uh, the Honourable Minister of State quoted, the minister may use his power to detain a person or subject him to supervision if the person is generally involved in a secret society or as a gangster. This should extend to recruitment activities on behalf of a secret society or gang. For my research, though, I have not been able to unearth any case where the power of the minister was invoked to impose a DO or an SO against a person for conducting recruitment activities for so secret society per se. So I seek the Honourable Minister of State's clarification and views on this matter. The final point I wish to make concerns provisions in parts 2, 3 and 4 of the Act. It is not well known that the Act does not just deal with detention and supervision powers which are set up in part 5 of the Act. This is not surprising. This is because at almost every second reading debate of the bill to extend the Act, the government makes its case by reference to its report card of the use of powers provided for in part 5 of the Act, not parts 2, 3 and 4. Respectfully, I think the time has come for the government to consider porting over parts 2, 3 and 4 to other pieces of legislation and then repealing these parts in this Act. Such a move would be more in accord with Parliament's intent when passing this bill to extend the Act for a further five years. Now, going down to some specifics, Part 3 of the Act deals with placing prohibitions and restrictions on the ability of workers to strike and employers to lock out workmen when they are engaged in essential services, which is defined in the Act. Such restrictions should not be controversial. The International Labour Organization, of which Singapore is a member of, expressly acknowledge that there may be a prohibition or restriction to the right to strike in essential services. I therefore suggest that the government consider taking steps to port Part 3 of the Act over to another statute, perhaps the Industrial Relations Act 1960. Parts 2 and 4 of the Act deal with public safety and public order issues. For instance, in Section 4, under Part 2 of the Act, it is provided that any person who has a subversive document, as defined in the Act, shall be guilty of an offence. Section 13, 13, under Part 4 of the Act, provides the power to the minister and the police to disperse assemblies which pose an immediate threat to public peace. I suggest that the government review, review these parts with a view to repeal provisions that may be seen as obsolete or ochoes. In an alternative, there may also be a case to port over relevant provisions to the Public Order Act 2009, which is a primary piece of legislation that the government relies on to regulate and control assemblies to maintain public order. Mr. Speaker, sir, in conclusion, I wish to reiterate the point I make about making it difficult for secret societies to recruit young people. Young people are not just the lifeblood of secret societies, but of our country too. It is said that there continues to be cases of youths falling victim to the machinations of secret societies. Each case is a case too many. We should call out the acts of recruiters and bring to bear the full force of the law against them either by prosecution under the Societies Act or through the exercise of the powers under this Act. It is these recruiters who seduce vulnerable and immature young people by making false promise of charmed and privileged lifestyles. Once our young get snared into these gangs, their future prospects will naturally suffer. Needless to say, their families suffer together with them. Through more resolute action against the recruiters, I believe you have a far better chance of turning our young people away from the dark alleys of crime and violence and instead focus on their flourishing of their own bright futures for their sake, that of their families as well as for Singapore. Thank you. Mr. Dennis Tan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the 15th time this so-called temporary act in its various forms has come before Parliament or its predecessor for the renewal of another five years from 21st October 2024. This law puts people behind bars or restricts their movement at the order of the Home Affairs Minister. Like the Internal Security Act, it is a controversial exception to our legal justice system, which usually requires every person to be charged tried, 
and convicted in court before his imprisonment or fine for his wrongdoing. Under this Act, the Minister can, with the consent of the Public Prosecutor, order the detention of a person for any period not exceeding 12 months if the Minister is satisfied that it is necessary that the person be detained in the interest of public safety, peace and good order. The Minister can also make an order for a person to be subject to the supervision of the police <clears throat> for any period not exceeding three years if he is satisfied that it is so necessary. Every order shall be referred to an advisory committee which shall submit its recommendation on the order to the President who has the power to confirm, cancel or vary the order given. Taking away someone's liberty either by detention or by restriction of movements and activities should not be taken lightly as the impact on liberty and freedom. Time limits for detention and supervision should also be viewed from the perspective that each order can be reviewed annually with the agreement of the President and at the recommendation of an advisory committee and on the advice of the Cabinet. Mr Speaker, in past renewals of the Act, there were members who have spoken up about their concerns about the undesirable aspects of the Act and have asked the Government when we can finally do away with this Act. I'm glad that we are here today to debate the extension of the Act for another five years and not more than that. In the past, some members have even suggested that the bill should not be a temporary one but should be converted to a permanent one. I certainly cannot agree with that. Many members have, over the years, also spoken in agreement with the Minister of the Day on variously the rationale for extending the Act to deal with the concerned crimes or criminal groups of the day. I read from ministers and MPs' speeches in the Hansard that this ranged from secret societies, gangsterism, drug trafficking, murders, extortion and protection records, to, in more recent years, money laundering, loan shark syndicates, organised crimes and global match fixing. There was also mention of arguably activities which are traditionally not regarded as criminal, such as prevention of strikes and lockouts, as well as communist domination. The MOS has also highlighted some of the recent serious cases in the past five years which required enforcement under CLTPA. I'd like to ask the MOS of the types of cases highlighted what is the number of detention and supervision orders granted for such type of crimes over the total number of all CLTPA orders in the last five years? I'd also like to ask the MOS in the last five years since October 2019, what is the total number of people who, one, have been detained under the CLTPA and two, have been subject to police supervision under the CLTPA? Can the MOS give a breakdown of the number of persons subject to CLTPA orders organised according to the different category of criminal activities? Can the MOS tell the House, this House, of the persons who have been detained in the course of the last five years, what is the proportion of detainees who have served more than two years and how many of the current detainees have been in detention for more than five and ten years respectively? I also like to ask the MOS in the past five years whether there have been instances when the public prosecu prosecutor actually withheld consent or raised concerns when the minister sought to make an order. Mr. Speaker, the Workers' Party objected to some of the amendments which the government sought to introduce in 2018, together with a five-year extension from 2019 to 20, 2024. Among other things, in 2020, 2018, the Workers' Party had expressed concern with the finality clause in the amended Section 30 of the present Act under the then Clause 3 of the Amendment Bill, which made the decisions of the Minister on Detention and Supervision to be final. The insertion of the fourth schedule, which may allow Ministers to bypass answering questions such as whether a case is serious enough to justify detention or why it is not possible to prosecute these persons in court and also expanding the Minister's powers to police criminal activities overseas. In today's second reading, the Government is asking for a five-year extension of the Act and no amendment of the current Act is being proposed. I confirm that the Workers' Party objections and reservations to some of the amendments raised in 2018 remain. However, we are in cautious support for the proposed five-year extension today, 
subject to the government's explanation for the authority's use of the CLTPA in the fi past five years and justifications for an extension of, the, of a further five years. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Ms. Sylvia Lim had articulated in the 2018 debate about the Workers' Party's support for renewals of the Act prior to 2018, the Workers' Party has, she said that the Workers' Party has accepted the uncomfortable compromise that this law entails on the constitutional rights to freedom and that we did not delight in taking such a position but did so with a heavy heart. Mr Speaker, in 2018, the Minister in justifying for an extension of the Act in the second reading speech raised examples of CLTPA being used against gangs, unlicensed money lenders, drug syndicates and global match fixing syndicates in the years before that. He mentioned of victims being unwilling or unable to identify attackers. He also mentioned of victims or drug couriers unwilling to testify in court for fear of reprisals. The Minister also mentioned that while the drug situation was under control, the challenges had remained significant. In MHS press release dated 7 March 2024, in respect of the first reading of today's uh, bill, it was stated that the Act is, I quote, an essential legal instrument for the police so that they can act effectively against secret societies and criminal syndicates such as money lending and drug trafficking syndicates where prosecution is not viable because witnesses are unwilling to testify in open court for fear of reprisal. MHA stated that since 2019, the Act has been used to detain or place under supervision persons heavily involved in secret society activities and leaders of organised crime syndicates such as an overseas licensed money lending syndicate. The same release also provided four recent cases of CLTPA enforcement, recent enforcement, all involving gangs and witnesses refusing to give evidence for fear of reprisal. The MOS has also briefly touched on this in his speech. Indeed, the scenarios shared by the Minister then and the MOS today are not new and CLTPA has been used in such cases relating to crime and drug syndicates and gangs for a long time and they would often involve fear of witnesses testifying in court for fear of reprisals. Looking at the explanations given and the cases mentioned by the Ministers in recent second reading speeches, I do wonder whether the government will require further extensions of the Act as long as criminal activities such as gangs, drug and crime syndicates, unlicensed money lending, etc., continue to persist, especially coupled with possible intimidation of witnesses. I'd like to ask whether MHS has also looked at other crime control or enforcement methods or models to deal with the specified criminal activities of gangs, drugs and crime syndicates and unlicensed money lending and to work around witness intimidation issues. How has SPF utilised the technological advances and deployment of technology in the police force? For example, use of cameras at an unprecedented scale these days to keep these crimes problems under control. Indeed, with the increased use of technology by our SPF and also the development of SPF over the years, will advances in our policing methods as well as technological advances help to control the HO problems of gangs and crime syndicates and mitigate against the HO problem of witnesses not coming forth to testify. Mr Speaker, even as the crime situation in Singapore may have been evolving and still does, it is difficult to deny that we have come very far in our crime situation since almost 70 years ago when this temporary act was first introduced. In recent years, we have also received assurances from Minister that the number of detainees under the CLTP have been declining as we review the need for a renewal of the CLTPA today for the next five years, I would therefore like to ask the MOS what would be the conditions or goals, the attainment of which may grant confidence to our government to consider not seeking further extensions in future. Over time, other MPs have also asked the question essentially of when we will be ready to do away with the Act. The current Minister of Home Affairs has asked a similar question even back in 1989. The then Home Affairs Ministers answered as follows, and I quote, Mr Shamugam asked, 
when can we do away with it? My answer to that would be, we can do away with it when we are satisfied that both the secret society component of our objective and the drug traffic component of our objective are reduced to such small proportions that we can safely say that we do not need this to control both aspects. The minister then went on to elaborate on his views. Almost 35 years on, I look forward to the current minister's answer and update. Mr. Speaker, subject to the replies, the questions and clarifications to my queries and concerns, the Workers' Party support the extension of the Act. Mr. Long Manway. Mr. Speaker, this bill seeks to extend the operation of the Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act or CLPTA for another five years, starting from 21st October 2024. This extension is not to be taken lightly because it continues to empower the government to detain individuals without trial. The Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Bill was first introduced in Parliament back in 1955 as one of the measures to counter the communi communist threat in Singapore. However, the most concerning part of the Act, namely the section empowering the minister to direct a person to be detained without trial, was introduced in 1958 to deal with gangsterism. During the second reading of that amendment bill, the Chief Secretary then, Mr. E. B. David, said, quote, It is only the exceptional gravity of the present state of gang lawlessness which compels the government to seek these exceptional powers for immediate use. No democratic government will likely curtail, will likely curtail the liberty of any individual by executive action, nor would it wish to curtail that liberty for a moment longer than is absolutely necessary. With the, slowing, with the slowly increasing mutual confidence between the police and the public, I sincerely hope that it will not be very long before the conditions in which these gangsters can flourish were no longer obtained. The normal processes of law will once more be adequate to detect and punish crimes. And these special powers can be thankfully surrendered." Unquote. This act was enacted in 1955. And if it is renewed this time, it will be its 15th renewal. 66 years have passed since the introduction of the provision, empowering the executive to detain criminals without trial. While gangsterism still exists today in Singapore, the extent of lawlessness is, we believe, not as rampant as it was back in 1958 when the executive power to detain without trial was introduced. The most important question which we face today in this House is whether the Act is still relevant and, more importantly, necessary in light of our present circumstances. This consideration must include other pieces of criminal legislation in force, and the sufficiency and efficacy of our judicial system. A balance has to be struck between person liberty and public peace and order. Have we struck the right balance with this proposed extension? As such, the PSP would like to seek several clarifications from the Minister. One, 
does the ministry intend to continually renew this piece of legislation for as long as crime in Singapore is not completely eradicated? Otherwise, can the ministry share with this House under what circumstances it is prepared to do away with this piece of legislation, which was intended to be temporary when it was first enacted in 1955? Two, can the ministry update this House regarding the steps it has taken over the years to review if our current judicial system can be strengthened to better deal with crimes of the nature that this Act is currently invoked for, without having to detain persons without trial. Three, can the minister clarify whether the Public Defender's Office is authorised to represent detainees under the Act to guarantee their access to counsel? Mr. Speaker, PSP recognises that the CLTPA does play a part in bringing greater safety and security to law-abiding citizens. However, as the powers given to the government under the CLTPA is so draconian, PSP is of the view that equally strong safeguards must be put in place to protect innocent Singaporeans against any potential abuse of these powers. We therefore propose to enhance the protections against possible abuse with three recommendations. The PSP's first proposed safeguard is to legislatively require that sitting Supreme Court judges sit on the advisory committees. While we note that Minister Shamugan said in 2018 that advisory committees will be chaired by sitting judges of the Supreme Court of Singapore, the government stopped short of codifying this change. The PSP is of the view that we must codify this requirement to uphold the separation of powers, provide greater clarity for all, and strengthen the perception that the advisory committees are independent. We believe that there is no downside to this. The PSP's second proposed safeguard relates to the making of detention orders and police supervision orders. Besides the public prosecutor's consent, the minister must also seek either one, the advisory committee's concurrence, or two, the concurrence of the president acting in his discretion before the detention order or police sub supervision order is made. The PSP's third proposed safeguard relates to the extension of the detention orders or police supervision orders. If an advisory committee objects to the extension of the detention order or police supervision order and the government disagrees, any extension should only be granted with the President's concurrence, acting in his discretion. The reason why we are proposing the second and third safeguards is because the ultimate decision maker currently is still cabinet. While the minister must hear the advisory committee's views and recommendations via its written report to the president, the minister does not need to follow those recommendations before making or renewing the detention order or police supervision order. Since the president does not have discretionary powers under the CLTPA and must follow Cabinet's recommendations. The PSP believes that these three proposals will strike the appropriate balance between personal liberty and public peace and order. 
Mr. Speaker, in, con in conclusion, we like to stress that the PSP does not, for any moment, take for granted the benefits that Singaporeans enjoy from our peace and order. We also recognise the CLTPA's role in keeping Singapore safe. However, we also recognise that our circumstances have changed substantially since the enactment of the CLTPA in the 1950s, and that detention without trial must always be considered with utmost caution and reluctance. We, also, we should also clarify our laws and codify the current practices that are already in place. In light of these circumstances, in light of these considerations, the PSP will oppose the extension of the CLTPA unless the safeguards are enhanced. Thank you. For country, for people. Order. I propose to take a break now. I suspend the sitting. I'll take the chair at 3.30 p.m. Order, order.
Order. Item 2, Resumption of Debate on the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Amendment Bill, Second Reading. Mr. Lewis Ng. So this bill will renew the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act for the 15th time. When I last spoke on the bill to renew CLTPA, I said that the title of the bill belies the fact that the act is far from temporary. The debate that we are having today on extending the CLTPA, CLPTA is an important safeguard. This ensures that there is parliament scrutiny on the continuing need for the executive exceptional powers under the CLPTA. While I understand the continuing public order and security pressures that justify the exercise of these powers, we should never forget the extraordinary nature of the CLPTA. The grounds for the Act and the powers under the CLPTA should be closely examined every time the Act comes up for renewal. I have four points for clarification. My first point is on the obligations imposed on persons subject to the police supervision order under Section 33. In the previous amendment, the obligations on the person subject to police supervision orders were moved into subsidiary legislation. The obligations are now set out under rules that the Minister can make under Section 49. Ministers shared that the rationale for doing so was to allow the obligations, which are operational in nature, to be amended based on evolving needs. Can MOS share the nature of these obligations that have been introduced in these rules. How frequently are the obligations reviewed and how have they evolved since the previous amendment to the Act? My second point is on the composition and processes of the advisory committees. The advisory committees are an important check on the broad powers under the Act. There are three types of advisory committees. The first, to review every detention order, a DO, and police supervision order, PSO. The second, to review every detainee's case at least once annually. And the third, to review detention cases for extension beyond 10 years. The, the advisory committees which reviews DOs and PSOs is chaired by a judge of the Supreme Court. Its members are senior lawyers and respected members of society, such as justices of peace. The advisory committees will consider all materials that the minister relied on in issuing the DO or PSOs. The compositions of the other two types of advisory committees are not as clear. Can MOS share the composition of the other two advisory committees which review existing detainees' cases at least once annually and for extension beyond 10 years? As these two advisory committees must consider the detainee suitability and readiness for release, can MOS share whether there are professionals on the advisory committees who have the relevant expertise? For instance, the advisory committee may have to take a view on the detainee's psychological state or receptiveness to rehabilitation. Additionally, Section 43 also requires the advisory committees to consider the requirements of public safety, the protection of individuals and the safeguarding of sources of information. Can MOS share what materials are provided to the two advisory committees that review ex existing detainees' cases to enable them to consider all these factors? Can MOS also share whether the two advisory committees that review existing detainees' cases regularly exercise their powers under Section 40 to summon and ex examine witnesses and to compel the production of documents? My third point is on the support of individuals subjected to DOs and PSOs. The Ministry has stated that DOs and PSOs are intended to break the vicious cycle of gang lawlessness and the climate of terror they instill. In order to break this vicious cycle, can MOS share what programs are in place for individuals subject to DOs and PSOs to reduce the need for the DOs or PSOs to be extended? Can MOS also share the recidivism rates of individuals subject to DOs and PSOs? My fourth and final point is on witness protection. I suggested in my speech on the previous amendments to the Act that the Ministry should study other solutions for securing witness testimony to reduce the need for the CLTPA powers. Ministers shared that the suggestions considered were not workable because it is difficult to have secret testimony from one witness who cannot be cross-examined in the trial process. However, Minister also said that the Ministry will review other options for securing witness testimonies. Can MOS provide an update on its reviews and options that were considered? So notwithstanding these clarifications, I stand in support of the bill. Associate Professor Razwana Begum. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I stand in support 
of the Criminal Law Temporary Provision Amendment Bill. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this bill seeks to extend the operation of the Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act for another five years. The Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act, which I will now refer to simply as the Act, has been in place since 1955 and contains several provisions relating to public safety and security in Singapore. Specifically, the Act allows the Minister for Home Affairs to authorise the detention without trial of someone suspected of being involved in or with certain crimes, including drug trafficking, homicide, gang rape, armed robbery, syndicate crime organisations, illegal money lending and people trafficking. The Act also gives police the authority to arrest and detain a person without a warrant, restrict the manufact manufacturing, manufacture and possession of documents considered to be subversive and restrict strikes and lockouts that might disrupt or prevent the delivery of essential services. So, Deputy Speaker, several of these provisions raise concerns related to due process, the separation of powers and the role and authority of the executive. This issue, these issues are important and need to be acknowledged and seriously considered prior to the approval of this bill. And I will now make some additional comments intended to assist those considerations. Before I do so, I would like to note that I'm the, currently the head of the Public Safety and Security Program at Singapore University of Social Sciences. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we first need to ask ourselves whether there remains a need for the Act. The Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act 1955 was initially intended to combat crimes, notably violent conflicts between gangs and secret societies, and to ensure the uninterrupted provision of, of essential services. The criminal landscape in Singapore has, however, changed, and Singapore now ranks as one of the safest countries in the world. We also now have an independent and impartial judiciary, highly trained and respected police and security forces, and a population that is known around the world as being law-abiding and civic-minded. Why then do we need such powers as contained in the Act? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the answer is quite simple and is related in the comment that is frequently made about Singapore. Low crime does not mean no crime. While crime rates across Singapore remain admirably low by international standards, we continue to face the threat of national and transnational crime that is increasingly sophisticated, complex and elusive, and can have far-reaching consequences on the personal and economic safety and well-being of individual citizens and the nation as a whole. Additionally, our low crime rates do not just spontaneously happen. They are the results of the coordinated and continual efforts of many hundreds of thousands of Singaporeans who work often invisibly every day to keep us safe and who are backed, by, backed up by legislation that gives them the authority and confidence to do what, they do what they need to do. As Thomas Jefferson famously said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And while this act may curtail or impede certain individual rights and freedom, it does, exist, it does assist to guarantee the collective freedom and well-being of Singapore and Singaporeans, something many of us take for granted every day and would complain loudly about if it was to vanish. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we also need to look at the unique geographical and sociocultural nature of Singapore in comparison to almost all other countries, Singapore is tiny with a population density that is third highest in the world. The impact of crime in Singapore is not the same as that in other, other countries. If our crime rates increase, they cannot be hidden or distributed across large ge geographical areas or within dispersed population groups. As an, an escalation in crime in Singapore will literally be in our face and the impact of that crime on the efficiency, cooperation and trust that drives Singapore could be catastrophic on our society, our economy and our reputation as a uniquely safe place to live, work and invest. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is easy to say that we don't need the Criminal Law Temporary Act 1955. However, the price we may pay if we remove and may not be the price Singaporeans or Singapore is prepared to pay. Mr Deputy Speaker, we do, however, have to do more to educate the public about this act. There is considerable and understandable concern among some Singaporeans about an act that allows the executive to authorise the detention of a person for up to 12 months without trial, with some people potentially thinking that we are arbitrarily detaining people for no good reasons. To counter this misconception, it might be helpful for the government to run a public education campaign about how and when the provisions in the act are applied and the checks and balances that exist within our system to ensure that the provisions are applied transparently and appropriately and only ever as a last resort.
It may also be helpful to remind the public that those who are detained are able to seek legal advice and appeal to the relevant advisory committee or courts. Other information that should routinely be made available to the public includes the number of people detained per year and the reason for their detention, the age and sex of the detainees, the number of detention orders confirmed, cancelled or extended by the President every year, the number of people on day released to attend employment and the number of successful and unsuccessful appeals. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we are to confidently extend this Act for another five years, we need to be in a position to openly describe and defend the Act and the circumstances surrounding its use. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of, its, one of the primary justifications for detention under the Act is the unavailability of witnesses willing, uh, willing or able to testify, thereby making successful prosecution in the courts unlikely. I appreciate the challenges explained by the Honourable Minister of State earlier. However, if more can, could be done to reassure witness that their identity and safety is guaranteed, then perhaps more of these cases could be successfully prosecuted through our regular court system. Likewise, if another justification for detention under the Act is the difficulty in obtaining reliable evidence, I would also welcome clarification about the existence and use of confidential disclosure or whistleblowing schemes. If more people were able to easily and confidentially provide evidence to the authorities, then perhaps they would be more willing and able to submit or even leak relevant information. These suggestions may be of particular relevance in those matters involving organised crime, syndicates or gangs, or where witness or evidence may not be based in Singapore. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will now make some comments about rehabilitation and reintegration. Detention serves two purposes. First, it removes the opportunity for offenders to commit further crimes and of equal, if not more, importance. It provides an opportunity to rehabilitate offenders so as to facilitate successful reintegration into society. In light of the above, I would welcome clarification that those detained under this Act are housed in the same prison, prison facilities as those sentenced through the regular court system and have access to the same rehabilitation and reintegration services and programs. I would also welcome clarification about the number of people who have been detained under the Act who have subsequently re-offended post-release and how this recidivism rate compares to the general prison population. That is, as well as initially removing these alleged offenders from society, are they also being successfully rehabilitated and reintegrated back into the community? Related to this issue is the gang membership. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I understand that the majority of people detained under the Act are detained for gang-related activity. If this is the case and gang-related activity remains a primary reason for detention, I would welcome clarification about whether those detained under the Act have access to programs specifically targeting issues surrounding gang membership. Mr. Deputy Speaker, while not all gangs or gang members are involved in criminal activity, in Singapore there remains a high correlation between gangs and crime. In fact, according to Singapore Prison Services, close to one quarter of the inmates who entered prison in 2021 had gang affiliations. This is a major issue of concern and we need to examine and address why so many people in Singapore, including young people, still feel the need to join or be affiliated with a gang. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would welcome clarifications about programs that specifically target issues surrounding gang membership among young people in the community. If we can intervene early in the lives of young people and provide them with access to more constructive and positive social networking options, we could perhaps start to break the ongoing cycle of gang-related crime. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, clarifications notwithstanding, I support the bill. In an ideal world, there will be no need for this act. However, with na while national and international crime continues to pose an identifiable threat to one of the defining characteristics of Singapore, our safety and security, the need for this Act remains. It is, however, beholden on us as members of Parliament to ensure that this Act continues to be used in a responsible and accountable manner and only as a last resort. Mr Lim Biao Chuan. Sir, allow me to declare my interest as a practicing lawyer who sometimes practice criminal law and I have previously represented a detainee who was detained under this law uh, and I appeared before an advisory committee. <clears throat> Sir, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act was enacted on 21st of October 1955. It's a unique sunset clause which states that the law continues in force for a period of five years. Now, this means that the law will lapse 
at the end of five years unless it is renewed by Parliament at today's second reading. The Act has been extended 14 times, the last being in 2018. The arguments for retaining this bill in our statutes have been put forth and debated on many, many occasions in this House. The essence of this law is that it allows the Minister to detain a person who has been associated with activities of a criminal nature without having to charge that person or bring him to trial. If the Minister is satisfied that the detention is in the interest of public safety, peace and good order, the Minister also has similar powers to order a person to be subject to a supervision of the police. And in this Act, activities of a criminal nature means any activity specified in the fourth schedule. In previous debates, the Minister for Home Affairs had listed the situations when the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act was applied. Firstly, against gang-related criminal activities. Second, against drug traffickers. Third, against unlicensed moneylenders. And fourth, against members of syndicates, example, global match-fixing syndicates. A more comprehensive list of the activities of a criminal nature are listed in the fourth schedule of the Act. So as a practicing lawyer, I am reluctant to deviate from this legal principle that every accused person is entitled to confront his accuser and to defend himself in a fair and public trial. It is an important principle as it prevents the abuse of process by an incompetent or corrupt government. However, I accept the, the argument that this law is needed in unique circumstances where witnesses are unwilling to testify because of the fear of harm to themselves or to their loved ones. Indeed, when this bill was up for renewal in 2009, I had supported the renewal of the bill. At that, at, at that session, I had given an account of a criminal case that I did in 1990, when I was asked to interview a secret society member who was charged in court for murder. However, 15 years later, the question before members of this House is whether the current state of criminal activities in Singapore would still warrant renewal of the Act after almost 70 years since the Act was first introduced. Is this law still relevant to Singapore in this day and age? Is it still necessary in maintaining law and order? For most members of this House, we have limited knowledge of the state of criminal activities, save for what was reported in the media or by the police. For example, in February 2021, Home Affairs Minister Mr Shamungam, in reply to a PQ, said that the secret society situation in Singapore is under control. Minister further said that an average of 112 rioting and serious hurt cases have been linked to secret societies in Singapore each year for the past five years. And cases involving the use of weapons such as parangs and knuckle dusters have declined over the same period. He said there was one case involving weapons last year, down from 12 in 2016. On 5th of July 2021, Minister said in a reply to another PQ, that notwithstanding that the secret society situation remains under control, the participation of youths in secret societies remain a concern. That's why we invest significant resources to educate and engage youths to deter them from joining secret societies. For illegal loan shark activities, in an October 2020 reply to a PQ, Minister Shamugam said that between April and August 2020, there were 1,587 cases of unlicensed money lending and unlicensed money lending related harassment reported. And this was a 40% decrease from 2,642 cases reported during the same period in 2019. Next, for drug related offences, in the 2022 COS, Committee of Supply Debate, Minister informed this House that in the 1990s, CMB arrested about 6,000 abusers. Per year. Now it arrests about 3,000 to 3,500 per year. Further, the death penalty is a key part of our system and approach to deal with drug traffickers. Thus, the question is if the secret society situation in Singapore is under control, if the cases involving unlicensed money lending has come down by 40%, if the number of drug abusers have also come down drastically since the 1990s, is there still justification for this law to be extended? So I listened carefully to the cases of secret society attacks by Minister of State, Mr. Faisha. However, in every criminal case, there will always be a risk of retribution, whether by secret society members or by simple criminals. The question is, how can we balance the interests of an individual to the right of due... How can we balance the individual of an individual to the right of due process 
versus the right of members of public to a peaceful and safe living environment in Singapore. So I've always been proud of the fact that Singapore is ranked one of the safest places in Asia to visit. According to the Global Peace Index, the safest, the safest Asian country to visit is Singapore, followed by Japan and Malaysia. It was reported that these countries have low levels of violence, crime and conflict, and high levels of stability and security. The country that tops the list of safest countries in the world, not just in Asia. So the country that tops the list of safest countries in the world in 2024 is Iceland, followed by Denmark, Austria and New Zealand. So my question to the Minister of State is whether these countries also have similar legislation that allows them to detain criminals without trial. How did they maintain their record of being safe countries to visit? And how did they deal with criminal activities that Singapore is so concerned with? So I submit that it is incumbent on the government to explain to Parliament that the rationale for keeping this law so that it is incumbent on the government to explain to Parliament what is the rationale for keeping this law so that MPs can make a considered decision whether to extend the same for another five years. And that's the purpose of the Sunset Clause. If the Minister is able to make out a compelling case, then I'll be happy to support the extension. To me, and I reiterate, that this is all about striking the right balance between having the right to due process versus the need to maintain law and order in Singapore. So allow me to also state for the record that I'm quite satisfied that there are sufficient safeguards to ensure that there's no abuse of power by the police. I perused the Hansa in respect of the 2018 debate on the extension of this law, and having read about the six safeguards listed by the Minister for Home Affairs, I'm sufficiently convinced that we do have a robust process to ensure that any decision made by, made by the Minister to detain a person without trial is carefully scrutinised and assessed. In particular, I'm of the view that having the consent of the public prosecutor before the making of a detention order is an important requirement. The public prosecutor, who is also the Attorney General, enjoys security of tenure under the Constitution, and the public prosecutor is free to disagree with the police or even the minister and still enjoy security of tenure. Next safeguard is having sitting judges of the Supreme Court of Singapore chair the advisory committee. And that's another key factor that persuaded me that any person detained under this law would have sufficient safeguards to ensure that there is a strong basis for the detention order. We are having the best judicial minds reviewing the minister's basis for the detention or supervision order and challenging the decision of the police in requesting for such detention or supervision order. And this orders will be reviewed annually by different advisory committees which will be chaired by different Supreme Court judges. And the final safeguard that I'm satisfied with is the fact that Parliament has to review the necessity of this law every five years due to the expiry date or the sunset clause of this law. So, sir, I wait, I wait to hear the justifications to be given by the Minister for Home Affairs for the extension of this law for the 15th occasion. Mr. Gan Thiam Po. Deputy Speaker, sir, since the amendments of the Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act in 1955, it has proven itself essential and effective in empowering the police to act against crime syndicates and secret societies. The prosecution of their cases is challenging due to reasons such as reluctant witness. In fact, I believe a lot of parliamentary colleagues in this House will have similar experience with their residents who are willing to provide information but request not to disclose their identity for fears of safety. In the interest of public, good public order, safety and security, this legal instrument must be available to our police force. The extension has become even more necessary in views of recent developments. The International Criminal Police Organization, Interpol, has been warning all his members, countries, about the urgent need to combat the skirts of organized crimes, which is, I quote, a risk of spreading as an epidemic level, unquote. Crime syndicates are forming alliances across borders and developing into international groups. The offence spelled out in the act, drug trafficking, kidnapping, organized crime, unlicensed money, money laundering, money lending and secret society activities, in fact, are the most common crimes committed by such syndicates. 
our zero tolerance of such criminal, criminal activities and our commitment to eradicating them has made us one of the safest countries in the world. In fact, sharing with my colleagues, Mel Chuan, he mentioned we are one of the safer in Asia. Last year, the Global Peace Index, in fact, ranked Singapore the sixth safest country globally. Our dedication to public safety has allowed Singaporeans and residents to live in a secure environment and enable us to attract investors, tourists, and even organizers. In fact, some of my residents or even visitors, friends who visit Singapore, have even told me they feel secure. Even their children wake up early, early in the morning waiting for the school bus at a bus stop. This is something that we feel very proud of. A survey by YouGov reported in January last year found that our government's performance in the categories of law and orders was the most highly rated, with 77% giving the assessments of good or excellence. It is a delicate balance, I agree, to strike between upholding individual rights and enhancing society, safety and security. Our criminal justice system seeks to end balance the interests and protections of the individual with the welfare of the general community. I am satisfied that the safeguards put in place are sufficient, as mentioned by my fellow colleagues, parliamentary colleagues including the requirements of the public prosecutor's consent before any detention orders or police supervision orders is introduced. Detainees are informed of the grounds of their detention and have access to legal counsel. Furthermore, the DO and PSO must also be reviewed by an independent committee. The present system of periodic review by an advisory committee with assessment by professionals, in fact, has been working well. Sir, as an open economy and an international hub, Singapore must maintain the highest levels of law and order, not just for the protection of people, our guests, but also as basic requirements for our nation to survive and thrive in this competitive and increasing perilous and volatile world. I wholeheartedly support the extensions of the Criminal Law Temporary Act for another five more years. Thank you. MOS Pasha. Mr. Speaker, I thank the members for their comments, suggestions, and, and strong support for the bill. Please allow me to address some points they have raised. Mr. Lim Biao Chuan and Associate Professor Razwana Begum ask if we still require the Act for the maintenance of law and order in today's Singapore, given that crimes involving drugs, unlicensed money lending and secret societies are now under control. I have explained this in my opening speech. The Act has been an integral part of our arsenal and complements our existing laws. We must not be complacent, even if the secret society situation in Singapore is under control. Mr. Lim also asked about other countries in the world which have topped the Global Peace Index and wondered if they have similar legislation as ours. I must emphasize that our laws are unique to our background and our circumstances. I've explained how the powers under the Act came about and how the Act has served us well in maintaining public safety, peace and good order. We have studied the gang situation in other countries that do not have a similar legislation. For instance, New Zealand continues to be plagued by gangs and gang-related crimes. The Economist reported that New Zealand had one of the world's highest gang membership rates in 2018. New Zealand has also seen a 75% increase in the number of youths aged from 18 to 25 years old joining gangs between 2017 and 2022. Without the Act, we face a real risk of an uncontrolled gang situation and a rise in violence and other serious crimes. We cannot afford to have this in Singapore. Mr. Dennis Tan 
has asked for various statistics on how the Act has been used in the past. MHA does not generally release information about the use of the Act as we need to balance the call for transparency against the need to prevent prejudice to investigations and to keep witnesses safe. That said, the Singapore Prison Service publishes statistics on detainee annually, and I would refer Mr Tan to those annual statistics. I've also stated in my opening speech that 123 persons were dealt with under the Act from 21st October 2019 to 31st December 2023. This comprised 86 detention orders and 37 police supervision orders. There are currently no detainees who have been detained for more than 10 years. Mr Tan also asked about the use of technology in police enforcement methods. In this regard, the use of police cameras has greatly assisted the police enforcement efforts, especially in unlicensed money lending cases. The police will continue to leverage technology as a key strategy in its enforcement approach. However, as we have emphasized, the Act is an instrument of last resort. Mr. Murali Pillay and Associate Professor Razwana raised concerns on the involvement of youths in secret societies and asked if the police could take more preventive measures. Mr. Murali also asked if powers of detention could be used on recruiters of secret society members who are not personally involved in violent activities. I will first say that we share the same concerns uh, about youth involvement in gangs and agree that their recruitment into secret societies must be taken seriously. The police adopts a two-pronged strategy of enforcement and prevention to address the problem of street gangs, particularly among youths. Besides taking firm enforcement actions, police routinely conduct community outreach programs and work with key partners to implement a range of diversionary and rehabilitative initiatives to educate the public on the dangers of joining gangs and to discourage, deter and detect youth involvement in gangs. Some of these partners include other government agencies such as MSF, MOE, and social service agencies such as family service centres. The police educational efforts include organising talks at schools, arranging prison visits for wayward youths, their parents and guardians, and promoting programmes like the Streetwise programme. We hope that these programmes will raise awareness and prevent youths from becoming involved in gang activities. When it comes to enforcement, the Ministry views recruitment of youths into gangs as particularly aggravating as this perpetuates the, the gangland lawlessness while corrupting our youths. Detention orders have been and will continue to be issued against recruiters. I will now address questions raised by members relating to the operational aspects of the Act. Mr Ng asked about the nature of obligations imposed on a supervisee who is under a police supervision order. The obligations that Minister may impose can be found in Rule 3 of the Criminal Law Obligations on Persons Subject to Supervision Rules 2018. These obligations include requiring the supervisees to recite at a specific place, curfews, restrictions on where a supervisor may enter, restrictions on who the supervisor may communicate with, among others. The rules were made in December 2018. We review the rules and obligations from time to time to ensure that they remain relevant and effective. Mr Ng also raised a few queries concerning the second and third types of advisory committees that review detention cases at least annually. These two advisory committees comprise senior lawyers and prominent private citizens with extensive relevant experience and knowledge in areas such as criminal justice system and rehabilitation of ex-convicts. As to Mr Ng's question on what support is provided to these two advisory committees to aid them in reviewing existing detention orders, they have access to all relevant information, including first, the nature and gravity of offences committed, second, the detainee's criminal antecedents, third, 
the detainees conduct and response towards prison rehabilitation program. Fourth, the detainee's likelihood of reoffending and continuing to pose a threat to safety and security. And last, the detainee's reintegration plans. As Mr. Gan Tiampo has rightly pointed out, this system of advisory committees being supported by professionals has worked well. Mr. Ng also asked whether these two advisory committees have exercised their powers under Section 40 of the Act to summon and examine a witness or to compel the production of documents. The advisory committees assess each case on its own merits and exercise their powers under Section 40 of the Act to summon and examine a witness if they deem it necessary. Mr. Leong Wan Wai has suggested additional safeguards to the Act. We note all that he said. The current safeguards are carefully considered and we, explain, we have explained several times why this structure works for us. We have explained why MHA acting with the Minister and with the advisory structures is the best structure and has kept law and order. It seems that they are not able to point to any abuse of the system. Singapore is ranked number one in law and order. I think what is key is let's stop pursuing theory and just ask whether it has worked or has not worked for us. If it has worked and there are no obvious flaws, then we must ask what we are trying to change. On the issue of the precedent, the responsibility for law and order lies with the government, not the president. The president is there in specific respects as identified in the constitution. Beyond that, the president has no executive power. And if something goes wrong with law and order, it is the government that is accountable to the people. We have an executive that answers to parliament. In specific circumstances, the president has powers to veto, but law and order is an executive responsibility, not the president's responsibility. Therefore, we do not agree with this suggestion. As for Mr. Leong's question as to whether the Public Defender's Office will extend aid to detainees, detainees are currently not assigned counsel by the state. However, they may choose to be represented by any lawyer of their choice or seek pro bono representation under schemes that may be available to them. I now turn to Mr. Ng's and Associate Professor Roswana Kruris regarding the rehabilitative aspect of the detention regime, in particular the programs that are in place for detainees while in prison. Detainees are housed in the various institutions in Changi Prison Complex based on their security risks and rehabilitative needs. Prison works closely with every detainee to understand each detainee's rehabilitative needs before placing them on programs to target specific behavioural and offending needs. Prison engages different agencies to provide a range of programs to detainees. For instance, prison collaborates with Yellow Ribbon Singapore to provide detainees with work opportunities. Detainees are also given access to vocational training, religious counselling and education. Where required, detainees undergo the gang renunciation program or psychological-based correctional programs to increase their self-awareness and equip them with pro-social skills to change their offending ways. Family support is also important in a detainee's rehabilitation journey. As such, detainees are encouraged to maintain a close relationship with their family members through letters and visits. Prison also engages specialised family services agencies to deliver structured family programmes that seek to address transitional issues for detainees and their families with a view of helping detainees build skills and confidence to maintain ties and build stronger relationships with their family members. Associate Professor Razwana asked about the recidivism rate of detainees as compared to that of the general prison population. With respect, it is not meaningful to make such a comparison as the two regimes are complementary to each other. For instance, an individual may be detained on one occasion and be prosecuted in court for other offences. The point I want to make is that prison takes 
the rehabilitation of every detainee seriously. Each detainee undergoes programs customized to his profile and needs. I now turn to the final issue as raised by Mr. Murali. He also asked about the relevance of parts two, three, and four of the Act and whether this provision should be ported over to other legislation. MHA is certainly cognizant that the Act consists of these provisions and had, in the course of preparing for this bill, satisfied ourselves that they remain relevant and necessary. We will continue to review these provisions and propose changes if necessary. Mr. Speaker, to conclude, for the reasons uh, uh, encompassed in both my speeches, the renewal of the Act is necessary and the Act remains relevant today. And I want to also mention about uh, a quote right, where Mr. Dennis Tan has quoted the Minister for Home Affairs in 1989 and has asked when the government will be ready to do away with the Act. Mr. Leong Man Wai also touched on this. We have to recognise that each time the Act comes for up for renewal, we must allow the government of the day to consider the circumstances and current conditions and come to the assessment of what is in the best interest of Singapore. We should not bind future governments in its assessment. The powers under the Act will ensure the continued safeguard of the public safety, peace and good order in Singapore. Once again, I thank members for supporting the bill Mr. Speaker, I beg to move. Are there clarifications, Mr. Dennis Tan? I thank the MOS for your answers to my questions. I think um, the MOS actually mentioned that some of these uh, information that I have sought, um, you said that it's not available. Um, since uh, members of this House have, in a, this, this act allow us puts the members of the House in a very special position to come together every five years to debate and decide on the extension. So can I uh, humbly request that the Ministry consider providing such information on a confidential basis just to the members of the House for purpose of the debate? Um, number two, um, just one more clarification. I believe I did ask that... Uh, for the MOS to clarify whether in the past five years whether there have been instances where the public prosecutor actually withheld concern, consent or raised concerns when the minister sought to make an order. Is the MOS able to address this question? Thank you. MOS Pasha. Question. Like what I shared earlier on why we are not able to share the, the details and I'm not sure member is aware the issue of gangs, secret societies, transnational crime is something that is very complex and deep. So we need to be very careful what we share. Right? But I want to assure the member that we have Singapore interests at our heart. So it's something that I want to assure. And we have shared information. Right? We have shared information uh, with the public, as I shared during the SPS annual reports. So that, that's one. The other aspect is about whether the public prosecutor has a uh, reservation or some differences in opinion. I think it's something that, uh, like what I shared earlier, right, uh, is uh, a process where we put up to the different advisory committee as well as the prosecutor. Right, and uh, it is a process upon which uh, the prosecutor may ask us for further details and uh, uh, clarification which we have done, done so in the past. Yeah. Mr. Leong Manoy. <coughs> Sir, I thank the MOS for his replies to my questions. Uh, I have uh, a few further clarifications to make. In principle, PSP would like to support the bill if our recommended safeguards are adopted. Can I ask the MOS uh, whether our safeguards are really out of the ordinary? Because, for example, 
when we ask the, uh, 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 the condition or the requirement that a sitting judge be part of the advisory committee and this condition <coughs> to be codified in the Act, this is something that the, 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 the government is currently already practicing, as what the MOS have said and what I've read uh, about the bill recently. So it is already something big practice. So what is the <coughs> problem of codifying it in the Act itself? This is my first question. My second question is requiring, uh, putting in another requirement for this bill that the president can act in his discretion is something that is also under the ISA, which carries the same uh, uh, draconian uh, power to detain an individual without trial. So since the ISA also have this condition uh, or that the president can act in his discretion, why can't this condition be also put into this CLTPA? Bill. Uh, that's, uh, my, uh, that's the clarifications I'm seeking. Thank you. Uh, MOS Pasha. So I maintain my stand and the reply that I've given to Mr. Leong. And I, I want to share with Mr. Leong that when I, share, when I say that the system has worked, actually the system has really worked. I work very closely with the inmates. I, and some of them are also under the CLTPA. And I could see that not only when they were detained, but also the processes that they went through. Some of them, their family members wrote to me, and I met the family members, and I assure the family members that they will have the reviews done annually, right? And many of them, uh, some of them I met well, when they were released, her family members, they shared, and some have transformed their life. They shared that the whole process actually helped them. While no one likes our loved ones to be detained, nevertheless, Singapore's safety and security is our utmost importance. And some of them even say that without this intervention, they would not be what they are today. So as I shared earlier in my reply, it has worked well, right? We welcome any suggestions that you've given. We will look at them, but I think what is key is that we want to look not only after Singaporeans, we want to look after our country, and we want to help those who are affected to get the right rehabilitation and reintegration journey. We want to help them, right? And we don't want to just change because something that is very theoretical. If we don't have something that has worked well, I think it's fine, right? But based on my ground experience, my engagement inside the prison, even outside when they release, I feel it has worked well, sir. Mr. Patrick Tay. I must have two um, clarifications to uh, questions for, for you. Firstly, is, uh, if you look at the CLTPA, there's an annual review process um, but is it true that uh, these detainees, especially for the first detention, they are only released after three to four years uh, for the first detention, whether this is true based on past practice? Second question, if you look at the CRTPA, there are five big parts. One big chunk on part three involves industrial actions uh, by essential service workers. I just want to you know, check in with uh, MOS whether MHS actually reviewed this and see whether it's relevant uh, in today's context, especially part one of the schedule. MOS pressure. So I thank the member for the uh, question. Uh, one is about the detention. Yeah. So as I shared earlier, there will be annual review, right? And uh, there is no minimum period, right? And uh, so there will be uh, opportunities for uh, the committees to assess uh, these uh, detainees based on the, uh, the criminal activities in question, the detainees' antecedents, 
the detainees conduct and response to the programs. And uh, so we not only look from the uh, outward uh, response, because we have a system where we really uh, observe, because it's gang related, uh, gang related, uh, some of the uh, symptoms, you can't see it physically, right? You need to sense, you need to, when you talk to them, and then when you see how they, res they, they, they relate to the others, and you will have to monitor some of these things. So it's very case specific, right? Uh, detainee specific, right? And uh, however, we, we, we feel that uh, we will not detain anyone beyond what is not necessary. Uh, with regards to your second uh, SQ, as I replied to Mr. Morales earlier, uh, we will continue to review these provisions uh, as, uh, and propose changes if necessary. So uh, uh, these are things that we will continue to look at. It. Okay. Are there any further clarifications to ask from MOS Paisha? I don't see any. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as are there are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Criminal law temporary provisions amendment bill. Committee stage what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. The question is that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. As many as are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 1 and 2 stand part of the bill. As many as are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Bill to be reported. Minister for Home Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the bill has been considered in, the, in committee and agreed to without amendment. The reading what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. As many as are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes of it. Criminal law temporary provisions amendment bill. Before I call the leader of the house, I just want to acknowledge the presence of the French Minister for Interior Affairs and his delegation uh, who are sitting in the public gallery. Welcome to our parliament. We are, we are just about to adjourn parliament. <laughs> leader of the house. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that Parliament to stand adjourned to a date to be fixed. The question is that Parliament do stand adjourned to a date to be fixed. As many as are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.